three minutes after ten is the time. I, I, I know you rely on me for this sort of thing, but occasionally the, 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 the stuff that I know, I, I, even I find hard to believe. So I am poised this morning, and I know what you're thinking. Really? I am poised this morning to use David Cameron as, a, as an example of, of impressive statesmanship. And, and yet, even as he and the Polish foreign minister, his Polish opposite number, prepare... Uh, to uh, encourage, shall we say, uh, uh, America to support Ukraine, to send more money to Ukraine. For some reason, I've got it filed away, and I've just checked because I thought, no, mate, you've got, you must have got your wires crossed on this one. You must have misremembered. I've got it filed away in the back of my mind that they were in the Bullingdon Club together at Oxford University. I mean, how the world works, Chapter 263, eh? David Cameron, the current Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, and Radek Sikorsky, who I've met and who is a lovely bloke, um, were in the Bullingdon Club together at Oxford University. I, I don't know what that means, but it seems highly unlikely to me that the two finest candidates for high office in two European governments at a time of international crisis, if, if the world were vaguely meritocratic, it seems highly unlikely to me that they would both have been in the same relatively debauched drinking club at Oxford University in the 1980s or late 80s or early 90s. I can't, I can't remember quite how old they are. Um, and David Cameron is on my mind a lot at the moment. <laughs> it sounds like a therapy session, doesn't it? He's on my mind a lot at the moment because he is one of the key architects of the mess that we are contemplating this morning. It's the... Uh, consensus now everywhere from Goldman Sachs to, to Farmers Weekly that much of the economic strife we are facing is a direct consequence of voting to become the first population in history to impose economic sanctions on itself and, and the invitation to cast that vote. And I think some of the blame for the result lies with David Cameron. It was his desperate attempt to uh, fend off far right or hard right extremities within and without his own party that prompted him to uh, call for a general election, that a, general, a referendum on EU membership, that and hubris, of course, the arrogant hubris of thinking that after, un, uh, well, two, two arrogant hubrises, if that is indeed the plural of hubris, uh, the first was to think that he probably wouldn't win an overall majority in 2015, which means no one would be able to hold him to his promise to have a referendum, he'd be able to say, oh, well, you know, we're in coalition and that's how it works. A bit of horse trading. Uh, Nick Clegg lost on tuition fees. We're not getting our referendum. Or the arrogance that followed the unexpected victory in 2015, and who here doesn't thank their lucky stars that we never had to endure chaos with Ed Miliband, the, the arrogance that followed that unexpected victory that led him to believe he'd be able to win uh, uh, the referendum result without any help at all from the leader of the Labour Party against the massed ranks of almost the entirety of the oligarch-owned British media, still undefined uh, um, uh, Russian interference, law-breaking by the official designated uh, leave organisation headed by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. He couldn't even get two of his, one of his old schoolmates and one of his closest friends on side. So how was he likely to persuade a country that was in danger of drowning in a sea of jingoism and lies? So, <laughs> James has taken the words out of my mouth. He's written, text has come in, he says, I know he's a plum that caused Brexit, but I rate him. Now, I don't rate him, uh, I, I, but I do think he's right on this occasion. So we'll, we'll give him the benefit of a stopped clock, by the way. And when I talk about economic woes, don't, don't get cross or get upset about the truth. Get upset about the people who lied to you. Don't shoot the messenger um, if you're finally reflecting upon the idiocy of what you did in 2016. Look at GDP per head. Right. That's actually more important than overall figures, because this is about this is essentially about what per capita GDP is about the distribution of wealth. It's the most important measure for our living standards. OK, so you take all the money in the, in the country or in an economy and you divide it by all the people in an economy and you find out roughly where you stand. So we are now. I mean, incredibly, given the way that Boris Johnson ran around claiming our growth is bigger than this and our what is bigger than that, and we got all the big calls right, uh, our, our GDP per capita is now 1.1% lower than it was before COVID. So you are worse off than you were before COVID. If you lived in America, you would be 6% better off. 
And if you lived in a, a European Union country, on average, you'd be 2.7% uh, better off. So that is, your, that is your GDP per capita. That is your, your seasonally adjusted, crucial measure of how well off you are in comparison to American and European countries, on average. And David Cameron did it. Not only did he bring in the austerity that led many people to think they might as well vote for Brexit, despite not really knowing what it involved, because it couldn't possibly be worse than what we already had. But hey-ho, newsflash, it is. Uh, not only did he bring in austerity, but he then introduced the referendum. And the, the marriage of referendum and austerity is a large part of the answer to the question of why we are where we are. The other large part, of course, is the influence of shadily funded think tanks and an absolutely insane right-wing media. Probably best embodied by a bloke called Alistair Heath, who features a bit in my book, How They Broke Britain, but he's certainly not important enough to get a chapter because his influence only extends to the poor saps that still read the Daily Mail. Daily Telegraph, he edits the Sunday Telegraph and writes columns for the Daily. But he has, I, I mean... Almost unbelievably, having been a huge supporter of Brexit and even more madly, a huge supporter of Liz Truss and Quasi Quartag. This is the Herbert that wrote about how it was the finest budget he'd ever seen in his lifetime, shortly before £30 billion got sucked out of the marrow of the UK economy. He has written, For the first time in my life, I'm now beginning to think Britain is finished. I told you this would happen. I told you that the people responsible for leading us into these un- utterly unnecessary problems would soon start complaining about the utterly unnecessary problems without taking any responsibility for it whatsoever. I give it, start, start your stopwatch now before someone tries to blame the per capita GDP thing on immigration. Blame it all on foreigners. Whatever you do, don't blame it on the people who've been in power for 14 years. Blame it all on foreign. Blame it on that bus driver over there. Blame it all on... I mean, it is extraordinary how the themes that we've discussed together over the last few years are now coming together in glorious technicolor. But we're not going to talk about that today. In fact, you know what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm actually, and this is so unprofessional. It's, it's almost like if you were to write a guidebook of how not to present radio programs like this one, don't, don't let yourself be distracted from the issue that you need to talk about because you don't really want to talk about it would be at the top of the list. I don't want to sit here and say, oh, good old Davy Cameron. Good old Davy Pye. It got, wow, what a blinder he's playing on the world stage. Because I, I literally, but you know how I feel about footballification. I am not only the inventor of the word, but I'm a sworn enemy of the idea. You, you have to loosen your scarf around your neck, otherwise you end up on Twitter whining endlessly about the last Labour leader or begging for Boris Johnson to be brought back. You lose the ability to reason. You lose the ability to count. You lose the ability to tell the difference between up and down or black and white. So I think David Cameron has done something really, really impressive. And context is important. Boris Johnson and Nadine Doris good. God, could you imagine what must have happened to a country for that woman to have become a secretary of state for culture? Never mind media and sport. But David Cameron, uh, Boris Johnson and Nadine Doris have both used their lucrative columns in the Daily Mail, which, of course, encouraged you to vote for David Cameron, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Theresa May and Brexit. They've both used their lucrative columns in the Daily Mail to write warm words about Donald Trump, warm words about the prospect of a second Trump presidency. That is how utterly corrupt conservatism has become in this country. And although David Cameron was a catalyst for the corruption, he stands before us today as an antidote to it, an alternative to it, the opposite of it. Weak, arrogant, hubristic, over-promoted, patrician, privileged, all of those things, all of those things. But he's got this right. He's got this right because the fear of what Putin is doing and what he might do next should be animating Western politics on a scale that we are not even close to. 30p Lee talking about culture wars and transgender toilets or gender neutral toilets when the prospect of a 21st century Hitler is unfolding before us. Here is ah, Lord Lord Cameron speaking this morning um, 
about the importance of funding Ukraine. Most important, what we discussed today is our partnership in supporting Ukraine. I see this as the challenge of our generation. Two foreign ministers standing here today, uh, it's like two foreign ministers standing here in the 1930s, where we faced a similar challenge from a similar aggressive dictator who was trying to change Europe's boundaries by force, who was ignoring the sovereignty and inviolability of other countries' borders. That's what we face today with Putin. And the challenge is, do we have the political will to match it? It's perfectly obvious that we've got the military sort of power. It's perfectly obvious we've got the economic power, that we have the diplomatic power, that collectively our economies outmatch Russia by 25 to 1. The question for us is whether we have the political will. I know that Poland does, I know that Britain does, and we'll do everything we can to persuade all our allies to commit to helping Ukraine in all the ways that we are doing. Do you know, there's probably a whole book to be written, don't look at me, I'm done. There's probably a whole book to be written about the things that keep David Cameron awake at night, if, as seems possible, he is actually possessed of a conscience, something else that would put him in stark contrast to Boris Johnson. But I wonder whether the failure to respond properly to the invasion of uh, um, uh, Crimea in 2014... Uh, when Putin took took much of the Donbass and took Crimea, or in 2008 when he invaded Georgia. I know that Cameron wasn't prime minister then, but he certainly was in 2014. In fact, he writes in The Hill, which is a sort of Bible for politicos in Washington, D.C. He writes, I do not want us to show the weakness displayed against Putin in 2008 when he invaded Georgia or the uncertainty of the response in 2014 when he took Crimea and much of the Donbass before coming back to cost us far more with his aggression. And that, it seems to me, is at the heart of, of this conversation, is, as Maya Angelou famously observed, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. If Putin gets away with this, he moves on to that, as, as with Adolf Hitler. God, did you hear my voice then? I, it's normally, there's a little bit of self-censorship that kicks in when, when, when there's any um, call upon comparisons. You know, it's such a heady brew to share. You can talk about the rhetoric or the language of the 1930s, as Gary Lineker correctly did when talking about Suella Braverman. But to talk about the politics of the 1930s is very different. To talk about the... Hey, you can see politics as the consequence of rhetoric, but to see uh, in 2024, as our own foreign secretary does, reflections of... 1930s Germany when Hitler was on the march metaphorically and, and, and shortly physically I mean really that should stop us all in our tracks especially when you remember that much of this is directed at Donald Trump whose support in Congress sounds sounds a lot like this a, a woman called Marjorie Taylor Greene think of her as a sort of American Nadine Dorries but this is what Cameron and Joe Biden if, if he is to prevail and all sensible people who understand the threat that Putin poses to the world order, this is what they're up against. I think that um, I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name-calling, um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. But do you think Putin's the good guy in all this? That's oh, incredible. That you'd think it was scripted by Armando Iannucci, wouldn't you? Or um, Jesse, what's his chops? Who wrote Succession? But no, that slammed door in the answer to the question of whether or not you think Putin is the good guy is probably louder than louder than bombs. But there it is. So he's right, isn't he, David Cameron? This is a moment for the West to recall the 1930s for Europe to recall the 1930s in concert, of course, with America. And, I, I mean, hard though it is to set aside the, the personal, separate it from the political. David Cameron owes the country, I, I mean, there are not enough days between now and the end of the world um, with which David Cameron could offer a sufficient apology for what he has done to this country or what he ushered in to this country. But on this occasion, he's absolutely right, isn't he? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. The question couldn't be simpler. Is the Foreign Secretary right to compare Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler? You need a bit of history to answer this question, but not that much, because most of it is 
almost imprinted upon our collective consciousness, isn't it? So, is he right? Is is David Cameron right to compare Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler? O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. It is 22 minutes after 10, and it is, I mean, you know, a truism, isn't it, that a stop clock is right twice a day. But when, when I've been on the road with a new book, one, one of the questions that I get asked at almost every event is, how, how do we fix things? How do we turn things backwards in the way that they went? And, and the answer that I usually give involves Amber Rudd. You know what I do, don't you, in my head whenever I say the word Amber live on the radio. I, 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 I've got a mental block on getting Amber Rudd mixed up with Amber Heard. And Amber Heard is definitely not someone I would point to as a signpost for a form of political rehabilitation for the nation. Uh, I, 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 so it is definitely Amber Rudd, who resigned twice on points of principle. But David Cameron is part of the answer to that question as well. I, I, I abhor what he did to this country, from austerity right through to Brexit. Almost every single thing he did was disastrous and born of privilege, a, a patrician arrogance and uh, a, a, a lack of genuine concern for, for detail and the country, in my view, right? But he didn't pretend that black was white. He didn't uh, insist that gravity didn't exist. He didn't claim that you could impose economic sanctions on yourself and somehow claim that you were better off. The breach in basic reality brought about by Brexit and the promotion of people like Nigel Farage and, uh, and, and, and latterly your sort of gullises and your 30p Lees and people like Liz Truss realising that professional advancement could be achieved by lying through your teeth. Kemi Badenoch currently doing that um, exact same play, uh, more nonsensical announcements yesterday about things that are not trade deals being called trade deals. So that absolute breach with normality, that breach, that abandonment of reality, David Cameron was before that. So my disdain for David Cameron is quite old fashioned. It's to do with disapproving of his policies and his politics. And if I'm feeling a little bit lazy and unprofessional, possibly even his personality. But it's not like the disdain I have for Boris Johnson, who lies and lies and lies again and gets cheered to the rafters by people like Alistair Heath in The Telegraph and Paul Dacre, the editor-in-chief of The Daily Mail, because he's on the promise of a peerage, even as he lies and lies and lies. And then he gets rewarded by GBBs and The Daily Mail as a consequence of having to run away from the House of Commons after being caught lying about lying about lying to the House of Commons. And so that, that, that's it. I'm not here to start the David Cameron fan club and possibly the presenter doth protest too much, but that's the point. He's a grown-up and you have to listen to him because Putin is like Hitler, isn't he? 03456060973. Ollie's in Manchester. What do you think, Ollie? Um, yeah, I mean, I, was, I just wanted to get the point across in terms of uh, the similarities between Putin and Hitler that have been voiced previously, I think it's quite important that people do see the similarities in terms of how, you know, how he's controlling his power. Um, Hitler, when he rose to power, he indoctrinated the people, um, censored, obviously, what was going online, not online, sorry, um, what was over the radio at the time. And obviously, people were indoctrinated into the beliefs of what Hitler was, was portraying and obviously believed that. Um, in terms of what Putin was doing, the majority of the country is limited to the media that is presented by Russia. So obviously the local channels, the local radio, and obviously that is censored as well. So what they what they hear and see and listen is only the views of Putin, of, of the current regime in Russia. So we, so we, 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 would, we would be baffled in 1930s by how the Germans could be, but when, certainly in the 1940s, by how the Germans could possibly be in favour of what is being done in their name, just as we would be baffled today by the levels of support that Vladimir Putin's imperialist agenda enjoys in Russia because it's presented to them in ways that would even make our media look honest. Yeah, I think if I think if the people in, in that part of the world had access to other medias, say our Western media and just other pieces of information, they would then be able to see see what's wrong and what's right. Do you know what I mean? Mm. In terms of what you were saying previously as well, if you know the response in twenty fourteen, the uncertain response, I think I think you've hit the hit, hit the nail on the head there because what what people don't realise is if it's happened once, especially with a, put, a person like Putin, it'll happen again. And obviously the evidence is there: twenty eight, two thousand and eight, two thousand and fourteen today and if he's not not stopped today realistically like you know what's next Do you know they next? teach they teach children in finland um fake news 
They actually have classes in schools to teach them to recognise online propaganda and online fake news because they recognise the dangers that Russian inter interference and attempts to foment instability in other countries, as they've done, of course, in the United Kingdom and America. When you've got a border with Russia, that can become even more dangerous. And, and yet we sometimes sit here sort of thinking everybody's equal and, and uh, my next guest will balance out the position that's just been laid forward. I suppose the final question, Ollie, just, just becomes what it looks like. So, you know, uh, we, we don't know at this point whether the House of Representatives will pass this. Trump is um, putting pressure on the Speaker to veto it because of a, a battle on America's border with Mexico. It also includes support for Israel, which is a more nuanced question for obvious reasons than a funding package for Ukraine. But if it goes through, and if Cameron is right, then do we edge closer to the notion of, of, of actual military engagement, military support, as opposed to merely financial? I think to get this over the line to to end what's going on at the moment in, in Eastern Europe, my honest opinion is that that's the only option. Um, until then, it's just going to be bloodshed on both sides. And, and, you know, it is funny, isn't it, how many of our conversations about world matters and, and about, um, you know, wars and matters of life and death sound ultimately as, as, as questions of when. You know, when will people realise that Israel's mission in Gaza is abominable and unjustifiable? Answer this week in the case of a lot of Western politicians. But, you know, last year in the case of some observers and commentators, when will the, the West realise that it is going to have to go further to stop Putin in, in Ukraine, even if... Even if that involves, and I know about NATO and I know what, um, uh, what, what the treaty entails, but uh, Putin plus Trump is terrifying. For, for anybody paying attention, for anybody honest. And of course, um, uh, you, your average Trump supporter is, is neither paying attention nor honest, up to and including Boris Johnson and Nadine Dorries. Thank you, Ollie. Simon and Ealing will be up next, which um, will be after the news, actually. Quite a lot of from me in the first half of this hour. I shall try my hardest to rectify or at least address that in the second half. But some mornings I've just got a lot to get off my chest and there's something really weird today about looking at the biggest domestic story, which is a recession, and the biggest international story, which is the British Foreign Secretary urging uh, America to back Ukraine and defy the likely Republican candidate in the next American election, and recognising that Davy Cameron is at the heart of both stories. He set the ball rolling that has led us into recession and sundry other problems, and he is on precisely the right side of history today, when it comes to urging America to defy Donald Trump, to urge Republicans to defy Donald Trump and, and back Ukraine. And rarely will you find a better example of the, a better illustration of the importance of resisting footballification. Because just because somebody has muffed up for the last nine times doesn't mean that on the 10th occasion they will definitely get it wrong as well. Whew. Half past 10 is the time, and Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. It is 10.34. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I've got a woke watch with a twist for you. Should we do that? I, I think we might do that now. A woke watch with a twist. Yeah, go on. Woke watch. Do you remember earlier this week, Grant Shapps wrote an article for the Daily Express about how the army was too woke? This was the day after the second massive aircraft carrier had failed to set sail for the coast of Norway to take part in one of the largest NATO exercises um, going. I, I, think, I think it's gone now. I think the second aircraft carrier has gone now, but the first one is still up on bricks. Do you remember that? That's what the actual Secretary of State for Defence... I know what you're thinking. Maybe Michael Green was dealing with the aircraft crisis, aircraft carrier crisis while Grant Shapps was writing the article. Maybe Sebastian Fox was talking to the Navy while Grant Shapps was writing an article for the... Daily Express. So it was, it was among the stupidest things I've shared with you under the Woke Watch banner. And it sprang from some nonsense in the Daily Telegraph about the army being too woke because it was trying to encourage its members to be a, a bit more modern and open-minded. Well, I, I mean, to be fair to the Daily Telegraph, they carry a considerably more important story today from the Royal United Services Institute, which is a, a proper think tank, i.e. its funding is transparent and widely regarded as a, as, a, as a sage and important voice on all matters military. They've just published a paper entitled Defending Our Defenders, Preventing Far-Right Extremism in UK Security Forces. Um, 
And what it does is call for more training for personnel that encourages questioning of stereotypes, biases and extremist ideologies. That is what you would call unconscious bias training being called for by RUSI, by the Royal United Services Institute, because uh, far-right extremism is rising in the ranks of both the army and the police. Extraordinary, really, to reflect upon the fact that the Secretary of State for Defence thinks it's a convenient and constructive use of his time to rail against things like diversity training and unconscious bias training, while the Royal United Services Institute is stressing that without it, the far-right cancer, the toxicity of far-right extremism might tighten its hold on the British Army. Oh, and guess what women in the armed forces came out to say about Grant Shapps' attack upon wokeness in the military? They came out to say that they'd been made to feel unsafe by him. I know we shouldn't be talking about these trivialities. We should be talking about gender-neutral toilets and 30p Lee feeding beans to Brendan Clark hyphen. But the Secretary of State for Defence has made women in the armed forces feel unsafe by warning about a woke culture infiltrating the army because it highlights and encourages precisely the sort of toxic masculinity that the Royal United Services Institute today warns against. That, that's Grant Shapps for you. That's a, that's a Conservative politician, not a candidate in Rochdale. That's the Secretary of State for Defence making female members of the military feel less safe today than they did before he opened his stupid mouth. And you tell me what's newsworthy and what isn't. I told you it was a slightly different Woke Watch today. Woke Watch. Thing, I suppose, with Matters Military, has David Cameron got it right? when he compares Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler. Um, and inevitably, Nigel Farage is currently agitating for Vladimir Putin, calling for negotiations rather than continued militarism. Speaking of people that you should probably be waking up to the reality of by now, Nigel Farage, the, the most unpleasant skid mark on the underpants of British politics, now complaining regularly about the state of the underpants. Incredible, really, but hey-ho, I'm sure the Daily Telegraph and the Times and the, and the Mail will be giving him another... Another pat on the head tomorrow. Joe's in Cambridge. Joe, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, Joe. Thank Sorry, you I, I, that's not fair, really, is it? Uh, are, are you ringing in to a perfectly measured and informed radio phone, <laughs> and, and now you come on after an unhinged rant from this self-obsessed presenter? I do apologise. What would you like to say? Don't, don't apologise. I'm a bit unhinged as well. Oh, there we I, go. I, some, some reflections, James. Yes. Um, my father and my father-in-law... Uh, were both Polish. They're, they're not with us now, but they were both Polish. Right. And in ni 1938, uh, Poland were well aware what was going to happen. They were both um, in the military, in their training. They both had got civilian careers as well. Um, August 38, or, or sorry, August 39, right. my father was called to the border in Tar Tarno. I won't say it right. My, uh, sure. my knowledge of Polish is not as good as it should be. He was there when the... When the <laughs> when when the false uh, the false flag came, yeah. and my my father in law was in another part of Poland where the Soviet Union were were waiting to come in. My father fought in the 1939 September campaign against the Germans, and he actually fought. Uh, I said, well, I, actually, can I say the Nazis? Because yeah, my, but both my father and my father in law did not have any anything unpleasant about ordinary people from Germany or from Russia. They weren't the problem. It was the dictatorship that was the problem. It was what they were doing that was the problem. And the, the similarities, where, where my father was fighting is now Ukraine. It was Poland then, because as you'll, you'll probably be aware and your listeners will be aware, the borders moved, moved backwards and forwards and have done over centuries. So it's very poignant. Uh, and yes. we we're, we're in World War Three. We're, we're in it. We, we think we're immune. We're not immune. People are actually fighting for the future of Europe and the world at the moment, and they're dying. And we're David Cameron is not someone that I have anything great to say about. But thank goodness, one of our politi politicians has actually stood up, and I'm pleased that he did it with with a, with a Polish politician as well. Yes, we have got to get real we we are there my, my dad was at university when he was called up Gosh. you know there are people at university here 
yes, one of your callers said it, yes, but be aware, because the, their intentions, um, my father-in-law ended up in Siberia for two years and then was was set free by some arrangement that was made with Stalin and, and uh, Churchill and came down and fought through Iraq and across into Sicily and Italy. He was at Monte Cassino, where he won the the Polish... Um, the Polish medal for, for bravery. Oh. So he fought in Monte Cassino and he fought in Ancona. My father came over, and this is another thing that this country has got so wrong. My, my father came over, and I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional about I it. I apologise to um, me. My, my father came over just after Dunkirk. He was at Dunkirk with a lot of other Polish, uh, Canadian, New Zealand, British, a lot of other French. He fought alongside the French. The French all didn't run away. A lot of the French were fighting for the future of their country as well. My father didn't get over at Dunkirk. He was amongst the troops that were kept behind to yeah. to fight the flank, I suppose, to Crikey. protect those that, that got away. But he did get away um, about four weeks later. He was on a uh, on, on a commercial ship in La Rochelle, um, and three thousand Polish troops were on this this ship. It was dive bombed by by. Uh, the, the Nazi planes. Um, they only had one or two machine guns between them. It wasn't a military ship. They got to a point of just about coming into Plymouth Harbour. So they, they survived that far. They were starving. They'd been out. They were cold. They were, they were, they were packed into cramped um, containers. And they were, they were told by Plymouth, whatever was happening in Plymouth, you can't come in. We don't want you in because if you come in, you're going to attract the... Well, the, the planes to come oh, and bomb I see. us. I see. Good. Um, I don't know that story. End, Has that story been yeah. told properly? No, it it, it, it hasn't, and it, and it really is sad because so many, there's so much apart from Dunkirk. Dunkirk was phenomenal, of and hat, hats off to everybody there. But the forgotten <laughs> people who stayed and managed <laughs> to get back. <laughs> you, you, sorry, carry on. I, I'll tell you why but, I chuckled but, in a moment. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> and and the master of the ship, and he was not a military person. The master of it was the SS Anderpool which was sunk later by a submarine, not, not at that time. Mm. He, then, he, then, he was told to take the ship up to Liverpool, and he said, I'm not going to, I'm bringing the ship in. Wow. And he brought the ship into harbour. What a story. What an extraordinary story. The reason I, I chuckled... I've got photographs of my father I'd love to on, know more. on the ship. I, yeah. I, and I'll, I'll tell you something you may not know in a moment as well, Please which, do. which is linked to the show. But the reason I chuckled is I just imagined someone tuning in at the moment you said, hats off to everyone at Dunkirk. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that's, but do you, have you ever heard Professor Hal on the show? No, I don't no, think he's, I have. he's one of the regular contributors to, um, to Mystery Hour, which of course happens every Thursday. Right. And, and yes, he, his surname is Sosabowski. And his uh, grandfather, is, or great grandfather, I always forget which, is, is Stanislav Sosabowski, oh. who is, of course, depicted famously in, 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 in the film about Arnhem, but who led a, a bridge too far, but was the leader of the um, yes. uh, the, 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 the Polish, well, Polish general in World War Two, who, who yeah. was part of Operation Market Garden. So he's been one of my guides to the importance of the contribution by polish men brilliant, and women brilliant. To, to the second world war but but you've given me another chapter in that story today uh, joe can uh, i ask when when did you see the specter of hitler on vladimir putin's shoulder when did you first see it i don't think i don't think it ever hasn't been there no I, i'm sorry and, and that may be that may be because of of, of the Eastern Europe Eastern European roots. Yes, that, of course. That I have. You've seen it before. Um, You've seen it unfold. Yeah, you know how this uh, story ends. Uh, my my father couldn't. My, my father and father. My father couldn't go back to. He went back to Poland once. It, my father was born twenty miles from Auschwitz. Wow. Okay. My, his sister was in Auschwitz. Oh. His nieces and and other relatives were in. I won't say this right, but it's Rowensbrook, which was the female version, yeah. because Auschwitz is a whole whole range of camps. So, I, I mean, that comes home to me that not twenty miles away from where I'm sitting now was Auschwitz, and, and my father, his his mother, and his family lived there. He got back once in the late sixties. Um, he couldn't go back because he was still technically in the Russian army. He's never been in the Russian army, but because the Soviet Union took over Poland, oh, he, yeah. anyone who was in the Polish military was by rights then, according to that, um, in that army. And my father and my fa father-in-law never got back to Poland. He was too afraid to go back, so he never got back to see his his family, his mother. What a, you do you honour their memory, 
Joe, if you let me say that. You really do. You honour both of their memories. But absolutely breathtaking detail and, 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 and important context for the question of why David Cameron, with, as you stressed at the beginning, his Polish counterpart, Radek Sikorsky, the Polish foreign minister, really issuing a warning to the world about what is unfolding before our very eyes, albeit that in the micro it is directed very much at American Republican politicians, particularly in the Congress, who are being urged to defy Donald Trump and, um, and, uh, and, and, and pass this big aid package for Ukraine. And, you know, we joke a lot about what happens when truly ridiculous people achieve positions of prominence in politics. We usually use Jacob rees Mogg or Nadine Dorries as examples. Make no mistake, this woman here is the American equivalent of, of 30p Lee, of Jacob rees Mogg, of Nadine Dorries. When you put people who do not understand anything except the salience and currency of hatred in positions of power, you are aiding and abetting your enemies, both present and future. I think that um, I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name-calling, um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. But do you think Putin's the good guy in all this? It is 10.51. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, you could be forgiven for having missed this story, but the Sal Salisbury Conservative Association has said that it received a formal complaint about offensive and inappropriate comments by Salisbury Mayor Atikul Hock on social media and WhatsApp. He is uh, a Conservative councillor and is set to be expelled from the party. He's been mayor of Salisbury since 2023. So stand by for at least three Daily Mail front pages about that and the anti-Semitism crisis that Rishi Sunak has on his hands. That will no doubt be um, arriving at Platform 2 any minute now. And, and the reason you have to point out these double standards is because if you are a true enemy of anti-Semitism, you do not use it as a, a, an opportunistic weapon with which to attack your political foes. It doesn't matter to me whether it is a conservative mayor or a Labour candidate who is being anti-Semitic. If you do not treat the offences equally, you are complicit in the offence. So I don't know if you're familiar with a, a pretty toxic website called Guido Forks, which yesterday tweeted on its Twitter account a, a, a profoundly and obnoxiously racist comment about Jews and Muslims. It was subsequently deleted, but that, that website is routinely uh, consulted and given stories by supposedly respectable journalists and by conservative MPs. And yet that tweet that was issued yesterday from that website, which sort of uh, specializes in, in, in propaganda and toxicity, was much worse than some of the comments that have been made by people in the public eye who have been compelled to step down. But you won't, you won't be hearing about that or reading about that. It's, uh, it's so important to have um, a clear eye on, on what matters. The offence is what matters, not the political affiliations of the person executing or committing the offence. So wait and see whether or not an actual mayor being kicked out of the Conservative Party over anti-Semitic remarks, the BBC is reporting, gets anything like as much coverage elsewhere as a candidate being disowned before he'd even got to the ballot box. 10.53 is the time. Simon is in Ealing to steer us back to the echoes of the 1930s. Can you hear them, Simon? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, I just want to say hello, nice to meet nice to talk to you. And, Likewise. Uh, amazing stories from the previous call. Wasn't it special? Really special. Yeah, really, just to, just to hear these stories of Paul fighting as a Paul myself. Mm. But, uh, but going back to the question, I mean, yeah, Putin is... A second Hitler. He's fueled by Russian imperialism and Soviet revisionism. He only cares that it's his only like goal in the world is to rebuild the Russian Empire. It, it, I, I often wonder about whether or not that is merely a vessel into which totalitarian ambitions <clears throat> and, and indeed self-preservation can be poured, or whether or not because uh, much of his followers are animated by that kind of imperialistic nostalgia. But is yeah, yeah. Will, will Putin be, be, be genuinely, sincerely motivated by that? Or is he just a kleptocrat? Is, are these just the best ways for him to enrich himself and keep his grip on power? We'll never know, I suppose, will we? I mean, 
I'd, I'd say that it, it is. I mean, you know, he is fueled by those ideas. He wants, you know, he is an imperialist. Yes. Um, he, for example, I wanted to give the example. He has shown himself to be very much against Lenin. He despised Lenin because Lenin destroyed the Russian Empire, understanding the power it had. But then he loves somebody like Stalin, who rebuilt the the Russian Empire, even though it was with a Soviet twist to mm, it. Mm. He did rebuild that imperialist image of Russia. So when I when I when I hear people like you and Joe, whose family background informs your historical knowledge, I think it's fair to say. You, you, yeah. you know, I probably know a bit more about Irish history than you do, for example. Um, although let's not test that because you sound like a very <laughs> well-informed fellow. But what do you feel when you hear? British politicians, more perhaps than the commentating class, but, but British politicians speaking almost, I wonder whether you hear a form of historical illiteracy. Um, or not, or not, of course. Because that's why Cameron's words today are so striking to me, because he is so obviously right. Yeah. But, but he is the first in a couple of years to go that far. And, and really, his comments would have been valid... Well, I mean, lest anyone think we've been too kind to David Cameron, his comments would have been valid in 2014 when he essentially sat on his hands during the invasion of Crimea and much of the Yeah, Bombay. absolutely, or even before that. Well, with, yes, uh, Georgia in Georgia 2008. Or Chechnya. Yes. So I don't know. Do, do, do you feel yeah. that histori- Do you feel politicians would benefit from some history lessons? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, like Chamberlain is still, you know, in the back of every probably. <laughs> politicians mind especially cameron yes 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 yes, but not necessarily for the right reasons thank you simon um and and joe if you are still listening an awful lot of love and gratitude coming in for um the the, the story of your family and i hope you don't think anyone's making light of it when several of my correspondents suggest it would make a bloody good film uh wouldn't it just as professor howell's uh, forebears uh, story uh, about the, the attack on Arnhem on, on was turned into a, a bridge too far. Sometimes you need the power of narrative and drama to really drive home the power of a story. And I'll give you a brilliant example of that that won't necessarily be springing into your mind while we're talking about the Second World War and the possibility of Vladimir Putin being a latter-day Hitler. The post office. Mr. Bates versus the post office. It's not a coincidence that that only really ignited among the British public when it was turned into a story, when it was turned into a drama about humans. So sometimes that's that's what you need. I, th- I felt Joe did that in telling his story about his father and his father-in-law in a way that uh, a history book rather than a story wouldn't be able to do. Carl is in Leeds. Carl, what would you like to say? Good morning. Hello, mate. Yeah, I mean, yes. So David Cameron is mostly right, although I would say that Hitler was far more of a true believer in what he actually said and felt, and that mm. you could just see the military decisions he made. He made a ton that clearly show a total disdain for those not of the Aryan race. There was no other explanation for it. Yeah. An awful lot of what he did showed clearly his zealotry. Although, I, and in this case, I think David Cameron's a cretin of the highest order as a general rule, but <laughs> in this case, he has got it spot on, I think. And I, I, I should say, I, I usually get texts complaining if someone uses the word cretin, because I think it's original use referred to a, to a medical condition. I appreciate that you had no intention whatsoever of of implying that, and I probably shouldn't pay too much attention to the kind of people who text things like that, but I, I just acknowledge it for the for the record. It, it, it's no, no criticism of you. I stand corrected. Thank you. Aye, yeah. <laughs> how, how about this? I mean, I don't know what word we'd use. Someone's just pointed out to me that it's not inconceivable that Liz Truss could still have been Foreign Secretary or Dominic Raab, let alone James Cleverly, who Shiv describes as currently playing Widow Twanky in the Home Office pantomime. It is quite quite a cast, isn't it? It's difficult, but at the same and same time, wherever it were, they have an uphill battle because our greatest ally have also done such an awful job of making the case for sending the aid to Ukraine, and they've heavily politicized it in their own right. For instance, they talk about how many billions they're sending Ukraine. That's not what they're actually spending on Ukraine. That's how much it's costing them to replace the 20-year-old hardware they're sending with shiny new stuff. Mm. 
So they punt the numbers, make it sound better. Right, I mean, still I mean, not getting those numbers. They're still not getting those numbers over the line. So, no, I, I mean, and, and and you know, going into the weeds a bit, the fundamental challenge facing Joe Biden and now David Cameron and Radek Sikorsky is is to persuade Congress to pass this bill, isn't it? Or at least to persuade the Speaker not to veto it. Regrettably, if you jump back to the 1930s, you can find plenty of people who quite supported Adolf Hitler oh, and loved him. America some, first, I think they called themselves, didn't they? Well, that's, I mean, it's and perhaps... Ironically me, enough. The extra, all the extra, all our wonderful access to information now has meant is that people can find stuff they agree with and that confirms their own... Yeah, well, I, and, and that is part of what um, Cameron is up against, although in the case of some of the Congress, members of Congress that we've heard from, particularly Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, it's not a case of having believed propaganda. It is it, 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 sensible, rational people trying to analyse insensible, irrational people. It's almost a spectator sport. Uh, these, 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 you can't. You can't. You can stare at someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Nadine Dorries for the rest of your life, and it will never make sense. It will never make sense because they, they are not sensible. They are in, insensible. But, of course, they are powerful in some cases and very, very angry and, and uh, full of bitterness and hate, which they manage to direct at others when, really, for every finger you point at someone else, there are generally three fingers pointing back at you. Four minutes after ten is the time. Funny, really, and, and hopefully not a, a, a signpost for the future, but David Cameron is at the heart of both of the stories that I would like to talk about today. Uh, Mystery Hour is on the way at 12. I will be very, very surprised if um, David Cameron makes his way into Mystery Hour. In fact, uh, this is more for the benefit of my colleagues. Can we make sure that no, no self-appointed comedian ringing in with a question about David Cameron in the, in the final hour of today's programme gets even close to on air. Uh, I'm not sure my patience could cope. But the news about the British economy, it's always a little bit complicated because in in, in technical terms, technical terms, in real terms, one quarter with a 2% drop in GDP would be much worse than two quarters with a 0.1% drop. But the technical definition of recession is two two quarters where there's no growth or two quarters where there is uh, a, a decline. So, so some of the language can be unhelpful and not for the first time. It's to ITV News that we must turn for some of the most important analysis. And on this occasion, their business and economics editor, Joel Hills, who has crunched the numbers that matter most to you and me. And those numbers are about GDP per head or GDP per capita, if you have, as Peter Cook might have said, got the Latin. Uh, and that's now 1.1% lower than it was before COVID. That You know, sometimes when I tell you, you won't read this in many other places or you won't see this everywhere. Obviously, if it's on ITV News, it's pretty blooming mainstream. If, if Joel Hills is putting these numbers, crunching these numbers, it is pretty mainstream. You might also see it on Newsnight. What I mean is that if, if your diet of news is in any way formed by newspapers and or people in broadcasting who just lift their opinions wholesale from the pages of the Daily Mail or, 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 or Rupert Murdoch's output, you won't be seeing this any more than you're seeing the truth about Brexit. In fact, the only way in which you'll see the truth about GDP per capita in client journalism will be in a cack-handed attempt to blame it all on immigration. Just mark my words, all right? So that numbers that matter most are the per capita numbers, and, and that's a simple division of GDP by the number of people in the country. And it's lower today than it was at the end of 2017, only by £14, but it's also lower by 1.1% than it was before we went into COVID. Now, compare that to other countries, compare it, to example, to America. America's GDP per head, as in the, the, the theoretical amount of money in every citizen's pocket annually. In America, it's 6% higher than it was before COVID. Across the EU, the average is 2.7% higher. Now, I know your Uncle Keith's Facebook is full of protesting farmers in France and, and Germany's gone into recession, and, uh, but you know your Uncle Keith doesn't understand anything. That's become clear since, since long before the referendum. He just repeats ludicrous lines that he's lifted from Facebook or, or, or from newspaper headlines that someone has uh, Snapchat, not Snapchat, it'd probably be more like tweeted or something like that. So these are real numbers about real people in the real world. GTP per capita is 1.1% lower than it was before COVID in the UK, 
In America, it's 6% higher, and in the EU, it is 2.7% higher. And the country is in recession. Um, albeit that the word is, on this occasion, more impactful than the numbers. It is nevertheless true that the country is in recession. And i turn you next to Goldman Sachs, who are rarely accused of being leftist or, or, or liberal or even woke. Goldman Sachs, of course, is where a young trader called shortly to make a ton of money from the global financial crisis, a young trader called Rishi Sunak cut his prof- professional profiteering teeth. Rishi Sunak often cited as someone who must know what he's talking about on matters economic because he worked for Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs reported yesterday on the state of the British economy, this before it became official that we have, um, with room for later adjustments, retrospective adjustments, the numbers are small enough to, to make that pertinent, margins of error, but Goldman Sachs reported before we went into recession that the British economy was 5% smaller than it would have been if the country had chosen to stay in the European Union. That is those terrible Marxist lefties at Goldman I won't swear, sacks. So obviously it's hit trade, it's hit business investment, because why would you invest in a country that has imposed economic sanctions on itself on anything like the level that you would do if it hadn't? And the steep increase in non-EU migrants coming to Britain who are more likely to be studying than working. So there it is. That is the land that David Cameron built. That is Boris Johnson's Brexit Britain. And speaking of Boris Johnson, I wonder whether you remember what he said about Brexit and recession and whether it's worth reminding you on the day that Britain goes into recession, the day after Goldman Sachs described a 5% blow to the UK economy as a direct consequence of Brexit. Boris, I think you just uh, lately show your true political colour. Yeah, go uh, on. By choosing to bre- uh, choosing Brexit, uh, now a lot of people don't trust you because of that. Now I have a, I'll give you a chance now in Come front on. of the audience. If we Brexit, yes, and we go into recession, would you have a political courage and dignity go on TV? And in Japanese style, politicians say, Give me harakiri. Sorry, no, 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 no harakiri. Sorry, I made it wrong. And I apologize to Bow British and apologize. For... Yeah, well, of course, if Zelko, would of course, if, if, of course, if, if there's, of course I will. <laughs> Go on then. He's got his own show, hasn't he, on GBBs now? They, I mean, most of them have. He must be on the, in the pipeline if it hasn't already been broadcast. Well, go, there you go. Let's just let's, let's make sure we didn't mishear that, shall we? Because so, so, we are in recession. If you if you if you follow Goldman Sachs on these kind of matters, it's a consequence of Brexit. And here's Boris Johnson. Boris, I think you just uh, lately show your true political colour. Yeah, go uh, on. By choosing to bre- uh, choosing Brexit, uh, now a lot of people don't trust you because of that. Now I have a, I'll give you a chance now in front Come on. of the audience. If we Brexit, yes, and we go into recession. Would you have a uh, political courage and dignity go on TV and in Japanese style politicians say Give me harakiri. sorry no 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 harakiri sorry I made it wrong and I apologize to Bow British and apologize before. yeah well of course if Zelko of course if, if, course, if, if of course if, if there's of course I will um, I don't know I, I, who was sniggering there but you could hear a snigger couldn't you in the in the, in this show oh yeah it's really funny yeah really funny that June I think 2016. Um, I don't know how my memory works sometimes, but there it is. And he's not the only one, of course. Um, there's also this skid mark. Are you prepared to apologise to this country and leave the politics altogether? Yes or not, Nigel? Well, there isn't much of a tradition here, is there? Because Alistair Campbell, who I row with today, has yet to apologise for the dodgy dossier or taking us into a war uh, that cost us much gold and blood uh, and did more harm than good. And I haven't noticed Gordon Brown apologising for selling off nearly 400 metric tonnes of gold at below 300 bucks an ounce. And I haven't noticed anybody that supported us joining the Euro saying, I'm really, really sorry we were leading you in... Oh, and those that signed us up to the ERM and sold squander our reserves. I see hardly anybody resigning, hardly anybody apologising. Tony, if Brexit is a disaster, I will go and live abroad. I'll go and live somewhere else. But you know what, Tony? Do you know what, Tony? It isn't 
going to be a disaster. We've just managed to get ourselves in a lifeboat off the Titanic. A lifeboat called Recession. Um, 1.1% lower per capita GDP than Americans and 2.7% lower than other Europeans. But my goodness me, what a pair of charlatans. Hmm. I, you know, I, I have this little internal dialogue sometimes. I run through three or four words in my head and I think, no, nope, better not. Oh, go on. No, on reflection, you better not. That's why I can never broadcast drunk. Uh, it would be a very, very bad thing to do because you would, even after one small ale, you would perhaps lower your inhibitions enough to say a pair of... Mm. Um, I don't know what question I'm going to ask you. I spent a lot of time coming up with a question for the first hour, but we are in a mad space now, right? Those two jokers, one promising to say sorry on television, the other promising to leave the country, both now working for oligarch-funded media, inevitably, and even Farmers Weekly yesterday. I think it was just a, a snap poll, an internet-type poll, so it doesn't really mean anything, although the Daily Express would have put it on the front page if it went the other way. Farmers Weekly yesterday showing that I think 5% of farmers are likely to vote Tory. Do you remember driving through the countryside in 2016 and seeing all those banners, all those enormous banners and posters and, and, and signs in fields saying, vote, leave, vote, leave, all the fire. I mean, I'm tempted, I was tempted to ask you until I um, dug a little deeper into that poll that Farmers Weekly tweeted. I was tempted to ask you if you feel sorry for farmers. But I'm slightly worried about alienating farmers because we all know how that turned out for Alan Partridge. And I am still very much a subscriber to the question or to the principle of contempt for the con men, compassion for the conned. So, as we look at what Brexit has done to the country, as we enter recession, as we compare ourselves to other economies and realise that we're worse, and as we wait for the pro-Brexit lunatics to try to blame it all on immigration, do we, quarter past 11 is the time, do, do we know what the escape route looks like? Do, do, when, when does the pendulum start swinging back? When will it become normal for UK politicians to say... We can't carry on like this. And have we reached... Has Okay, here's the question for you. So you've got Farage and uh, Johnson there in your mind. They are con men. They are not the conned. But I spent... 2016... I've spent nearly eight years intoning the phrase contempt for the con men, compassion for the conned. Right? I even delivered that phrase from the stage in, in Parliament Square at one of, the, one of the marches calling for a second referendum. Contempt for the common, compassion for the common. One of the maddest moments of my life involved looking out at the sea of people that had assembled on Parliament Square and seeing my own catchphrase held aloft on, on, on placards. Contempt for the common, compassion for the con. And it, it, it kept me honest through a lot of that mess. I mean, it's a little bit condescending because some of the people that have been most hideous to me, I could chalk up as conned rather than con men, which allows me to feel a little bit um, paternalistic and possibly, dare I say, patronising. But you have been conned. The people that you now see on uh, uh, the people that you now see on social media are desperately trying to pretend that things are worse in Europe or that they haven't been sold an almighty pup or that sovereignty. And at which they can't define and control which they don't have were the prizes for which it was worth paying with recession and a, cost, a continuing cost of living crisis. And of course, another part of the reason why we're in such a mess is the promotion of people uh, supremely unqualified to be doing the job. And I don't just mean that the last lot, the Jacob Rees-Moggs and the uh, Nadine Dorries, the current Chief Secretary to the Treasury, doesn't know what a percentage is. I'll remind you of that shortly. But I think the question I will ask you is, is what, and, and you can use the B word to answer this question, but there will be other factors as well. So why are we in such a mess, particularly on GDP per capita? Why are we in such a mess? But you can't just say Brexit. You have to explain how it's worked the consequences of Brexit in your life, in your business, in your livelihood. Why are we in such a mess economically? And this is important, all right? And, and I want you to ring in on this. Has contempt for the common, compassion for the con run its course now? 
Are we now at the point where somebody somewhere has to start standing up and saying, this is madness. The definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing in the hope of a different outcome. Have you reached... I, I, I am in a way asking whether you feel sorry for farmers. Oh, and I, I'm ready for the dead cow to be delivered to the studio by the close of play today. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Do you still feel sorry for people who were conned by the likes of Johnson and Farage? Or has that sympathy expired and now it is just time to lampoon them and criticise them and condemn them for the nation damaging loons? that so many people believe them to be. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. Why Why are we in such a mess? And 03456060973, what, what do you do with the Brexiter in your life? That's the question I want you to ask. How, how do you keep this conversation alive when the people that have brought us to our knees are so desperate for us to stop talking about it? 22 minutes after 11. I, I'm a little reluctant to open Idiot's Corner because I'd much rather these people still rang me. In, in, in many ways, I owe much of my uh, uh, much of my career in the last few years to the kind of people that used to ring me telling me Brexit was going to be brilliant. But I'll read this from Chris because it gives you an idea of what desperation looks like. Uh, you will never let up on Brexit. No, that's patriotism, mate. If someone set fire to your house, you pursue them to the ends of the earth and order them to either rebuild it or get the hell out of Dodge while grown-ups get on with the business of fixing the mess that they've made. That's patriotism. So you're damn right I'll never let up on Brexit. Europe is not all roses. So what? What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Absolutely nothing. Uh, more countries want to leave. That's a lie. Uh, but of course, you have been lying to yourself since 2016, so it's no surprise that you would be lying to my listeners today. And illegal immigration would still be the same. France did nothing before and is still being paid to wave the boats bye-bye, the boats bye-bye, as they head off to the UK. That's also a lie. Uh, and neatly overlooking the possible deployment of the Dublin Convention, which you are probably too stupid to know about, but are welcome to look up. Uh, look also at inflation in the USA. They've, what's the USA got to do with Brexit, champ? Except as a, a comparison of GDP per capita and the question of why it is that the UK is in recession and the US is not. They've not pushed interest rates, but prices have gone nuts. We're still held to ransom. You, mate, you really need to Google inflation in the USA. We're held to ransom by EU-based energy companies. If you're being held to ransom by somebody who's in a team that you used to be in, then you're a bloody idiot for leaving it, aren't you, you chump? Um, and where else are we? Railways and others that profit from us and expect our taxes to fund their upkeep. Yeah, because damn that Labour Party for selling off our national infrastructure to foreign governments while insisting that domestic governments shouldn't be allowed to own it. And Chris concludes with wake up, and this is actually poetry. And I hope you're Shouting this, Chris, at the moon as you make your way into Idiot's Corner this morning. Wake up. You only see what you want to see. <laughs> so that's what it looks like. Uh, is it unfair? Is it unfair to suggest that the only people still clinging to the carcass of Brexit are either those whose careers were built on it, like Boris Johnson and, uh, and his ilk, or who can't climb down because their careers would be over if they did, like most of Fleet Street and many people who do what I do for a living, or people like Chris who would struggle to lace their own shoes. Is, is there anybody left once you've filled up those three categories? Self-interest, self-preservation, and weapons-grade stupidity. 03456060973. Toby's in Bristol. Toby, I haven't really asked a question this hour, have I? It's a bit, bit of an unprofessional business. I've just offered up the ingredients and invited you to make a blancmange. So off you go. Um, go back to the 2008 financial crash. People like Sunak working in the banking industry. They all gradually move over um, and up the greasy pole of politics to become junior ministers and secretaries of state and, and prime ministers. And the libertarian... Um, you know, uh, project about skinning our country using austerity leads you directly to Brexit because it's what they wanted. They want to be rich. They want to be in control. They don't like the, the, the support the state gives the, the general public. I, so they you, destroyed it. I, yeah, I, the only, I, I agree with all of that. The only bit that I think needs clarification 
is the fact that austerity was not designed to deliver Brexit. This is why having warmish words to say about David Cameron in the first hour of the programme so, so nearly stuck in my craw. Until the vote was cast, I don't think he realised, he arguably may not even realise now, or at least not admit it to himself, that austerity drove people into the arms of obvious charlatans and snake oil salesmen like Farage and Johnson because people's existences had been sufficiently diminished to make them believe that they had nothing to lose in voting for unspecified change. So that, that bit wasn't deliberate, was it? Um, no, I think it's coincidental, but the, the ultimate bit, what it caused was a group, of, a massive number of people who felt so disenchanted with the state that they were, they were not going to support us staying in the EU and the, the press and the uh, successfully made the EU the bogeyman that they could stand up against. And, so and, and do you know... An undefined referendum. Yeah, and actually, the more you look into it, and I have, <laughs> the more you yes. realise how influenced that generation of Tories were by what has latterly become known as Tufton Street thinking. So, arguably, they could have been gaslit themselves into thinking that austerity was an answer to the country's problems, when in fact it was a catalyst for creating and increasing all of them. So so a little less um, excuse or a, li a little less wiggle room for, for, for the likes of Cameron. And uh, uh, finally, I, uh, I mean, this bit here, actually, no, I'll squeeze in another caller, Toe, because there's a lot of people waiting. Jer Jerry's in Copenhagen. Jerry, what made you pick up the phone? Hello, James. Um, <clears throat> yeah, a little short story. I live in Denmark, and um, about a year ago, I wanted a well-known antiseptic cream that I can't buy in Denmark. Savlon. used to buy. No, can I name it? Germaline. Okay, yeah, just checking. Carry on. Germany. Yeah, okay, yeah. And um, so I ordered some from a website, which was actually in Belfast. Yeah. And it was about three tubes, about £1.40 a tube, plus a couple of quid for packing. I thought, that's fine. So then I get a letter from the customs in Denmark, I've got to pay the Danish equivalent of about £17 mm. before they deliver it to me. So I just thought, well, which I did. But then I thought, well, I won't do that again. No. And then that online and UK I, store, although by dint of being in Belfast, it might actually, I don't fully across the Windsor framework, but it might have got, if it was in Birmingham, they certainly wouldn't have, nothing would have changed. But you wonder why that business is now doing less well than it was before Brexit. And there's your answer, because you're not going to order any more from them. Well, neither is anyone else in Europe. Well, of, I course, mean, of course you're not. I, this is so, this just... is so obvious, isn't it? And yet you still have people like Rhys Mogg and Johnson and, and, and their cheerleaders in the, in the right-wing media claiming that things have gone well. Yeah, and I never actually understood what that business about Northern Ireland was going to be different to the rest. I never really understood what that meant. Would that mean that if I did it today, I wouldn't have to pay? I, I, don't, I, think, I think, I mean, listen, I'm good, but I'm not perfect. I think it might. No. I, I, think, I think that the... That, that there shouldn't be any difference for you in dealing with a company in Belfast than there is with a company in Dublin. So and I think in that, England should export everything they've got to Belfast. Well, I think you might sell it to you. I mean, there may be loopholes that can be used, but certainly all the business people we spoke to immediately after 2016 and certainly after 2019, 2020 were either selling up or opening depots in continental Europe so that they could serve customers like you from within the customs union and or the single market rather than having to serve it from without and incur a £17 duty charge for their customers when their germaline arrived in wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen. Uh, it's half past 11. And, and why are we in recession? Uh, 0345 606 0973. And I'm going to get this question right one day, but I, I've got a feeling that it's not going to be today. But a question speaks to this issue. How do we deal with Brexiters now? That, that to me, is a fascinating and generational inquiry. First of all, there aren't many left. Second of all, some of them insist that Brexit was still a good idea, but it went to a different school. I don't think you can ever deal with them because they're lost. You know, you, they might as well be arguing that the earth is flat or the moon is made of cheese. But the ones that are not quite ready yet to admit that they made a terrible mistake. The ones who I still think of when I use the phrase content for the con when compassion for the con, how do we deal with them? 0345 6060973 is the number you need. It's 1131 and Thomas Watts has your headline. 1135 is the time. You can't deal with Brexiters while leading politicians refuse to talk about it, says Alan, adding IE or EG, Keir Starmer. I, I, I don't know. I... I, I, I <laughs> 
I mean, for me, the problem is that the liars are still in charge. And Starmer was never a liar on this. Uh, you know, he was absolutely clear about how stupid it would be. Uh, as were, oddly, people like Theresa May and even Liz Truss, would you believe? And Starmer clearly hasn't changed his tune. But they're still lying. Keith in Poland, I think, is closer to where I am. He writes, as long as Kemi Badenoch keeps spinning the idea that memorandums of understanding with American states are, quote, trade deals, end quotes, then people will still cling to the idea that Brexit is a good idea. New York is supposed to be the latest deal in the making. Um, and thank you, to, as a tribute to the late Steve Wright, thank you for the kind words about the show, Keith, in Poland. Um, and you're absolutely right. There was another bunch of them uh, yesterday came out of Kami Badenoch's department. They, they, these things, so that you understand, they are utterly meaningless. And yet the Secretary of State for Business is passing them off as trade deals, briefing journalists that they are trade deals. They are not trade deals. Only Congress can negotiate trade deals. These memorandums of understanding sort of say, oh, if Congress ever negotiates a trade deal, we should definitely have a chat. That's the memorandum of understanding. New York being the latest. The fact that there is literally nobody in the state legislature in New York who is empowered to make a trade deal with a foreign country. And, and yet, the lessons of Liz Truss appear to have been learned by nobody. The last one was uh, Florida. Did you see this? This is important. This is why you have to keep talking about it, because they're still lying. I read in one newspaper that Kami Badenoch had signed a trade deal with Florida worth up to $3 trillion. So I thought, I'll have a look at that. Sounds good. Maybe there is a Brexit benefit after all. And do you know what it was? It was a memorandum of understanding with Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, which delivered precisely zero cents to British business. It, it, it eased or created precisely zero imports or exports. Nothing. Nada. Diddly squat. Zip. I nearly said sayonara, but that would be the wrong word to use when I'm clumsily trying to run through lots of different ways of saying nothing. Niche, nil, zero and zilch. And yet it was written up in the British media as a trade deal worth up to $3 trillion. Do you know where they got the figure of $3 trillion from? Even I couldn't believe this. They got the figure of $3 trillion from the entire economy of Florida. So when this was written up by a sympathetic journalist, the impression given to their readers was that Kemi Badenoch had signed a deal with Florida that could be worth $3 trillion, whereas in fact she'd signed nothing that was worth nothing. But they still get written up as trade deals or mini trade deals. The mind boggles. And as long as bilge like that is being pumped out by the Department of Business then we have to keep telling the truth. When the liars are in retreat or when they start telling the truth, we can shut up. But I'm not going to lie to you. I, 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 there are days when I don't know how to do it. There is a picture. Sorry to go on, but this is important. I'll be with you imminently, Peter and then Alan. There is a picture posted on the 7th of February of this year by Rishi Sunak. It's a video. It's a still from a video in which he sets out the context we found ourselves in, his words, economically, after becoming Prime Minister in 2022. So, in a sense, it's a list of things that Rishi Sunak holds responsible for our economic situation, right? This is... You know how much I love those moments of distillation. Those moments where stories converge, planets align to prove beyond the shadow of doubt that we are in the upside down, that we are being taken for complete mugs by the people in power. This could be one of the best ever. So on the 7th of February of this year, so uh, merely a week ago, a week and a day ago, a week and a day before it was announced that we'd gone into recession, the former Chancellor and current Prime Minister drew a little chart on a, on a flip chart of the reasons why we were in the economic situation we were in when he became Prime Minister in 2022. Would you like to know, boys and girls, what was on that list? A week and a day ago. In one. NHS, vaccine and furlough. Three contributors to our economic context in 2022, when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. In two, you've got war, most obviously in Ukraine. 
in three. This is a tribute to Bullseye for the benefit of younger listeners who got no idea where I'm deploying this ludicrous voice when talking about the economy. Energy bills. So, so far, the Prime Minister, when giving you the economic context which he inherited in 2022, has given you the NHS, vaccines, the furlough, the war, energy bills. He now gives you inflation in four. Inflation. And in five, in five, COVID. Can you think of anything that's not on that list? contributors to the economic context in which the UK found itself in 2022. Well, I've got a good idea. Let's ask Rishi Sunak's former employers. Who who could be trusted more, especially for Rishi Sunak fans? Who would you trust more than Rishi Sunak's own employers? Goldman Sachs. What have they got to say about the British economy that he inherited in 2022? <clears throat> this is from Rupert Murdoch's Times, that well-known Marxist organ. Britain's economy is 5% smaller than it would have been if the country had chosen to stay in the European Union, according to an, an analysis by Goldman Sachs. A sharp hit to UK goods trade, weaker business investment and a steep increase in non-EU migrants coming to Britain who study rather than work have held back economic growth. So we're in recession and a week and a day ago, the Prime Minister made a list of reasons why and he didn't put Brexit on it, despite the fact that his former employers at Goldman Sachs, where he was apparently talented enough to make hundreds of millions of pounds are absolutely crystal clear on not only the role but the scale of the contribution that Brexit has made to our economic woes. And that is why we've still got a problem. Kemi Badenoch still punting utter bilge about non-existent trade deals that she has the audacity to call trade deals and Rishi Sunak trying to sum up the economic state of the United Kingdom without even mentioning the thing that his former employers at Goldman Sachs credit with swiping 5% off our economy. Factor in Liz Truss, also a consequence of Brexit, of course, and you get another 30 billion quid wiped off. And still they won't talk about it. Eddie Stratford asks, what was Bully's special prize this week? I hope it wasn't a speedboat. 11.42 is the time. Peter is in Oxford. Sorry, Peter. I'm in one of those moods today and you've probably <laughs> forgotten why you rang in. Hello, James. How are you doing? Goldman Sachs are quite right. I mean, um, there are lots of reasons why we're in recession, but uh, I, I think we can't ignore Brexit. Um, and we have to look at the number of industries that are uh, hitting the wall at the moment um, and the complete reliance we have on uh, labour from other countries. We, it was previously the EU, now it's from outside. Either way, uh, without the um, contribution of, of migrants, including myself, actually, but, uh, I should say I'm Irish, but yes. uh, without, without migrants, the, the economy would, would be vastly weaker than it is. And the evidence about that is very clear. Um, and what I'm going to say, the government published something to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the, uh, of, of the official Brexit date. Um, Kemi Badenoch was... published something to celebrate the first anniversary of the <laughs> Department of Business earlier this week, Indeed. but I couldn't bring myself to read it. Well, these are works of fiction, aren't they? I mean, if you want, if you want something, some bedtime reading. But uh, what, is, what is, I think, proves to us is that the gaslighting is continuing, um, that there's really no, no dawning of insight uh, on the part of our political leader. What does, that, that, what does it look like? What does the end look like? Not the end of the world, but the end of this weird period of purgatory well, in British politics when everybody will finally agree, at the very least, that if you're making a list of the contributors to the economic context of 2022, then a former Goldman Sachs banker should acknowledge that Goldman Sachs puts Brexit pretty much at the top of the list. When, when does that damn break? The main reason why, why I phoned is because I think the message has got to be that it, it is never too late to hope. Mm. I mean, both, both the Conservatives and Labour are now colluding in this message that Brexit is a done deal and we can make it work somehow. And the reality, of course, as people are beginning to realise, is that you can't. You can fiddle around the edges. But at the end of the day, Brexit is a failed experiment. And it's never too late to admit that you've made a mistake. Now, th there's this thing called sunk cost fallacy. Yes, I know. Which I think is behind a lot of it. And basically, it's people, uh, you know, people are throwing good money after bad. You make a bad decision, you think, well, I can't go back on that, and I've, I've lost so much, or invested so much in this product or whatever it is, and, you know, th th this, this dodgy car, which I keep having to spend you know, thousands of pounds on, on repairing year after year. Well, I think more yeah. of the, you know, the email asking you to send £10,000 to, to, to some Middle Eastern country because my cousin is the president and he can't get his money out of the whatever, and then you send it and they come back a week later and say, we just need another £10,000 yeah. to get everything over the line, and you send that, you're more likely to send it the second well, time than you I are. I know, but, you know, fool me once, more fool, more fool. Yeah, <laughs> you know, know, twice, more fool me. And, uh, you know, so what I'm saying is that there is hope. 
and it's not it's never too late no i know but you're not telling me when 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 the dam breaks because you've still got people writing articles about it you've still got people like badenoch punting utter bilge about non-existent trade deals you've still got rishi sunak not even putting it on a list of contributing factors and it needs to be heard and the european movement for one thing i mean i know you've you've been aware of the european movement and you've very kindly said good words about it but you know, we are, we are putting out a message. The mainstream media are being very quiet about this. Um, if you look at Byline Times and look at similar publications, you'll see... The New European do a splendid job. You, yeah, the tiny voices, um, t- small but growing um, voices, Peter. And yet, and yet none of us actually know. And, I, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of both of those outlets. None of us really know what the, uh, what the end will look like. So one of the journalists I quote most in my book, How They Broke Britain, is this Alistair Heath lunatic. Um, and he writes today, this is the man that said Liz Truss's budget was the best of his lifetime. Brexit's brilliant. Ramona's are sucking it up. So the headlines were unbelievable. You know that there's headline generators on social media where you can make it look like a proper headline. There is no journalist in the world who you have to double check more than Alistair Heath because the headlines to his articles in the Daily Telegraph, the comment desk of the Daily Telegraph, if they had a car... It would be one of those cars where the wheels fall off and, and the bloke driving it's got a red nose. I, I mean, the comment pages, it pains me to say this. My late father worked for the Daily Telegraph. It's the pinnacle of a long and illustrious career. But the comment pages of the Daily Telegraph, I think it would be a disservice to crayons to suggest that they must be written originally in crayon. The headlines that appear above this Muppets uh, commentaries are... The, the, it, absolutely essential that you double check them to to be sure that they're real and guess what they all are they're all real and today's from someone that brought you brexit someone that claimed remainers were going to spend the rest of their lives weeping into their uh the book that proved them wrong but people that brought you quasi quarteng's budget people that were cheerleading for boris johnson people that claimed theresa may was the new iron lady today's headline for the first time in my life i'm not i'm begin i'm now beginning to think britain is finished Britain's decline over the past 25 years has been staggeringly rapid. And yet in 2016, these these people were telling us that we could go it alone and that we were the finest country. And I, I just don't know anymore what the end look what what does the end look like? When does this boat turn around? That picture of Sunak. Economic context in 2022 with no mention of Brexit. Kind of t- to me seems to sum everything up. I've got some good news for you. Ukraine's military said it had destroyed another Russian warship off the coast of Crimea yesterday. And we'll catch up with the significance of that and some of the broader issues in play in that um, unfolding conflict with the rather brilliant Phillips O'Brien, Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of St Andrews, immediately after this. A couple of you pointing out that we have actually had the words recession and World War Three issued with straight faces on the programme today. And of course, not that long ago, they were both Project Fear. Do you remember? And it is to the latter of those two nightmares that we turn next with um, Phillips O'Brien, the Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of St Andrews. Uh, can we begin with what well, I think is uh, can be described as good news, the significance, if you would, Phil, of Ukraine's uh, destruction or sinking of another Russian warship off the coast of Crimea yesterday. I've read in some quarters, possibly yours, that Ukraine is actually winning the sea war. Is that is that fair? Absolutely. It doesn't get the coverage of what's going on exactly. in the, the front line uh, where the land war seems to be really going very, very slowly. But Ukraine has done remarkably well in the war in the Black Sea in 2023 and early 2024. Remember, when this started, the assumption was the Russians would simply control the sea, bottle Ukraine up. Ukraine had no navy. And indeed, the Russians might threaten the Ukrainian coast. Well, what we've seen throughout 2023 is the Russian Navy has been, one, sunk in very high numbers. I mean, the loss of major warships for the Russian Black Sea Fleet is very high now. Those ships have been forced into the eastern Black Sea. So they're a long way from the Ukrainian coast. The Ukrainians are now shipping as much out of their ports now as they were before the Russian invasion. So indeed, they've opened up their sea lanes They're shipping now the amount of grains they were shipping before the invasion, which no one thought would be possible. Mm. And in terms of strategic uh, elements, what they're doing is trying to isolate Crimea. So these ships that they're destroying are very heavy logistical ships. They can carry a lot. Think of them in many ways like have well, big armed 
freighters, right? You know, or ferries yes. that would roll on and roll off. So they they can take these things in, take things out, move supplies, and they're armed. Um, but if the Russians don't have these ships, then supplying Crimea relies almost entirely on the Kerch Bridge, and that's a real problem. Um, I, I hesitate to sort of ask the next question because we asked it in the context of the ground offensive in the in the, in the early weeks of, of the conflict, and we don't really ask it anymore because it's reached this point of attrition. But how do you account for Russia's failure, given you know the issues of scale, and as you've just explained, the preconceptions that they they would be very dominant in this field? What what I suppose what's gone wrong is the question I'm asking. Well, the Ukrainians have adjusted to new technology better at the war at sea. I Again. Mean, this, there's two things that seem to be doing this damage to Russian warships. One are actually the cruise missiles that were um, given by the United Kingdom and France, the, the scalps and storm shadows, they've done a lot, but also the development of sea drones. Um, these are very small, they almost look like tiny motorboats uh, stuffed with explosives, but the Ukrainians have used those to extraordinary effect, um, often attacking at night. The Russians don't seem to be able to track them. They don't seem to be able to sort of defend their ships, particularly with these attacks at night. So the Ukrainians have taken advantage of the technological change in the war at sea, and the, the Russians don't seem to be able to keep up, or they certainly are not able to protect their ships uh, from that. So that seems to be the general technological scale. So what people thought mattered, haven't mattered. Large warships have become targets as much as they are assets. How interesting. I, 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 before you go, I will ask you to comment on events in, in America overnight. But before that, mm. if you can, a broad, a broad brushstroke description of, of what is now happening on land. Where, where are we on land, if you would? Well, the Ukrainians have gone into defensive mode. Remember, they haven't received any American aid for months. Yeah. Um, and indeed, the American aid they were receiving in the fall after September is quite limited. So they didn't receive a lot October, November, December. They've received basically nothing since the new year from the United States. So they don't have nearly the ammunition they had before. They don't have the artillery shells. And that has meant that the, the Ukrainians have gone on the defensive. And they're not trying to uh, advance, which, by the way, is good. Uh, advancing in this war is incredibly hard. I mean, people who talked about tanks streaking forward had no idea what this war was going to be. They simply misunderstood it. Vehicles are vulnerable when they advance. So the Ukrainians aren't going to advance, is my guess. Um, they're going to hope the Russians do. And when the Russians try to advance, they're going to exact a, a, a great toll. It's more, I think, for a while, the Ukrainians are going to try and go over the front line. Um, and damage the Russians behind it, because going through it is such a difficult task. But we're in for a slog of a period on the front line, uh, that it's going to be not a lot of movements. The Ukrainians are going to try and hold on with their reduced ammo. I mean, this could be a real problem for them if they have serious ammo shortages. I mean, they already do have, from what we can tell, ammo shortages. This could become more of a problem if it holds up. But if they can hold the line, they will try to use it to um, wear down Russian forces. Um, I, you've kind of answered this question in, in terms during your answers to my previous ones, but I'll ask it explicitly. The significance then of David Cameron and, and Radek Sikorsky um, adding their voices to the calls to defy Donald Trump, calls upon Republicans in the American Congress to defy Donald Trump and, and clear this aid package, which I think you've highlighted the importance of it. Yeah, I know Europeans, sadly, will make much of a difference in this discussion. That, <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a basically the Republican Party walking around in terror of Donald Trump. Yeah. If there was a vote in the House of Representatives, a free vote on this bill, it would pass. You would have aid for Ukraine. There's a clear majority that would vote for aid for Ukraine. The reason it's not is because the speaker won't bring it up and because the speaker is terrified of the Trump wing of the Republican Party in the House. And the speaker is really powerful in the United States House. It's not like the speaker of the House and parliament here. Mm. The speaker can really determine what bills get a vote or don't get a vote. And so what we are what happens is it's being held hostage by the Trump wing. And it's always about Ukraine. All this stuff about the borders, nonsense. Yeah, they, they could have had a, a deal. They could take Ukraine out and vote on it separately from the border. Trump doesn't want aid to go to Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, the Republican Party in the House, many of whom do want that, are really stuck on what to do. Now, it might be 
the Northeast Republicans and places like New York yeah. start saying, look, we got to have this vote. We're getting hammered. I mean, people talk about the Trump wing and yeah, the Trump wing plays really well in Alabama mm. and North Dakota and South Dakota, but it's starting to really hurt Republicans in places like New York. And they might start going, look, we need a vote. We, we got hammered last night in, in New York third. Sorry if I'm getting too particular about U.S. congressional races. But there was a special election in a U.S. and a New York congressional seat. And the Democrats won far more than the polls said they would win by. And so it might be that these Northeast, more moderate Republicans say to the speaker, look, we need a vote. But it's still a long way from happening. And it's it's 50-50 whether this gets a, gets a vote or not. Philip O'Brien, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. We should, and I say this every time I talk to you, we should do it more often because I always come away understanding uh, these complicated issues better than I did before. Philip, of course, applies his, his, his academic trade at St. Andrew's University, um, which I had the pleasure of visiting, actually. I should have popped in to say hello. I've never been there before. Absolutely beautiful. A stunning part of the world. The time now is 12 noon. It's Thursday. Hmm, I wonder what that means. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Mystery Hour, with James O'Brien. Four minutes after 12 is the time. Um, I, 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 I owe you an apology. Don't tell anyone I told you this, all right? But I think I only got the question right in the last hour at about 12.42. And then, of course, Phillips O'Brien from St. Andrews University joined us at 12.45 or shortly afterwards to discuss matters Ukraine. So I, that, that, there's a lesson for us all there. I'm not sure what it is, and I'm certainly not sure what it is for you, but there's a lesson for me there. To try sometimes, particularly with the stuff that you think is going to be easy because it's Brexit and that's your middle name. Uh, try a little bit harder to come up with a more focused and clearer question and it'll just be more fun for everybody. On the other hand, of course, it gave me an opportunity to um, uh, wax a little bit more lyrical than I usually do on the question of where we are now politically and why it's so important to continue calling out and standing up to the shysters and liars that have led us to this pretty pass. A day in February in 2024 when the world's words World War III and recession are being bandied about quite casually and which in 2016 were apocalyptic uh, examples of so-called Project Fear. How weird. What a difference eight years makes to go from insisting that they're completely hyperbolic exaggerations to describing them as in one case a reality and in the other a very very real danger but that's enough of the news it's thursday it's five minutes after 12 it must be mystery hour your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere on your radio dial Uh, i won't bother explaining how it works because it becomes imminently clear Uh, I just remind you of the only rule, which is that if you hear someone ask a question, don't look up the answer and then ring in. A, because I'll usually be able to tell, but not always. And B, uh, it it makes a mockery of the whole practice. It makes a mockery of the whole game. So the number you need remains the same. And there's a prize, I should remind you, a, a mystery hour game, which is a really good game. In fact, yesterday we accidentally proved how brilliant it is. I don't know if you were listening yesterday. If you weren't, then I'll need a note from your mum by the end of break. But if you were, you'll remember that I gave you a little bit of a, of a quiz. I said, why is the phrase, and I'm going to try and get this question into the booster pack, actually. It's a booster pack coming later this year. Why is the phrase Brexit means Brexit in the news today? And I gave you three choices. Was it A, because Marc Francois has revealed the title of his second volume of memoirs? Is it B, because it's what school children shout before going in for an ankle-breaking tackle on their opponents? Or is it C, because Craig Andrews, a 31-year-old man from Great Yarmouth, or possibly Dundee, has revealed that he's had laser surgery to remove his Brexit means Brexit tattoo after losing his job as a consequence of Brexit? Now, one of those answers is correct and two of them are made up and on the mystery hour game you get one made up answer or or, or one false answer and one true answer on your card Uh, you get the question and two answers and you also get the opportunity to make up your third answer and what i loved about that little exercise yesterday was that a huge majority of people listening went for my made-up answer about Craig Andrews, the 31-year-old, having his tattoo removed. And that's a beautiful illustration of why the game is so much fun. Because it's not like a general knowledge quiz. It's not like playing Trivial Pursuit. A huge amount of the fun is involved in coming up yourself with the false answers, with the, with the fake answers, and trying to persuade other people through your powers of delivery 
to vote them as the right answer. Anyway, I get yeah, you can win one by being my favourite contributor of the day, or you can buy one at mysteryhour.co.uk. Eight minutes after 12 is the time. And that's it. I think I don't need to... Oh, well, terms and conditions are at lbc.co.uk. I think that covers it. Are you ready? Then I shall begin. Claire's in Kingston. Claire, question or answer? It's a question, please, James. Carry on, Claire. OK. Um, so I wondered why hmm. children start getting afraid of the dark, um, not when they're babies or toddlers, but all of a sudden it's around school age and they're suddenly afraid of the dark. And it seems to be all the kids I know and there's programs about the dark and um, I used to be afraid of the dark and well, uh, just wondered why. Well, is it, I mean, it's because of your imagination, isn't it? As your, yeah, as, why does it suddenly kick in? Because your age? imagination is suddenly kicking in. Your imagination <laughs> is developing. You start Your stories have changed. You're not going to read a tiny baby, a story about <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood being eaten... Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> little Red Riding Hood being eaten by a wolf, are you? But when, true, but when, the wolf wasn't in the dark, was he? He was in the... Yeah, but you can. Yeah, but head. yeah, but you can imagine that there is a wolf in the dark. That's the point. If the lights are on, you know there's no wolf in the room, Claire. It's true. If it's the lights true. are off, there could be a wolf there. It's why we're throwing the things under the bed as well because we can't see it, and our imagination fills in the gaps. It's true. It's true. It could be that. So, but so what we um, what I will do, rather than arrogantly taking a round of applause myself, I I, I, I will ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, A, if that's true, but B, yeah. it, when, what, what you're really asking is when does our imagination start scaring us? Mm, maybe. Aren't you? And when does it stop? Never. <laughs> no, it never yeah. stops. It never stops. Mm. You're always going to be frightened of the thing that might be around the corner. Uh, you know, even if you're bravely marching towards it inside, if, if you're not frightened, you're stupid because it might be a wolf. True. It might be a True, wolf that you're running But that's bravery, towards. isn't it? All right, why are we scared? Of, anyway. So I'll, I'll keep it simple. Why are we scared of the dark? Okay, cool. And, and or, or why why aren't babies? And then as they get older, they are. That, that's possibly the question, isn't it? If babies aren't scared of the dark, why are children and, and later adults? Thank you, Claire. Sam's in Feltham. Sam, question or answer? I have a question for you, James. Carry on. Um, why do some ancient manuscripts have to be handled with... Uh, gloves, yeah, and some don't. Well, I, are, are we talking about manuscripts of the same age? No, no all different ones. Well, and the reason why I ask is yeah. because I was I was watching um, Dig for Britain. Oh yeah, and they they went back and they found some manuscripts. Where? But they were they weren't actually using them with gloves. They weren't. Where were they found? Where were the manuscripts found? Somewhere. Where, where though? <laughs> I, I, I think they were just in some library or something. Well, it might. It's probably to do with dryness, is it? That's what I thought I'd ask you. Because well, what I'm the glove is designed to do? What is the glove? Let's work backwards. The glove is designed to stop moisture, as in sweat on our fingers, from getting into the paper. Yeah. Which is not a problem with, if you like, normal paper. So it will depend on how the papers have been stored. If they're if they're not desiccated, if they're not dry, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a weird question because you know, I mean, <laughs> you haven't got any chronology here. So because 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 the answer could be if it's more than five hundred years old, you need to wear gloves. But if it isn't, you don't. But you've got no points of reference apart from some papers you saw on Dig for Britain that you can't remember where they came from. And also, what do you mean by ancient? What <laughs> than you? There's a big world between new and ancient, Sam. It includes old, shabby, no, very, aging. Very, very old. Yeah, but you don't know. How, so where were these documents from? What, what era were they from, the ones on the telly? Oh, uh, probably about 500 years ago or something. I just completely made that up, honestly. This is such an amateurish <laughs> inquiry. All right. Because it, 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 um, I, I understand about the, um, the sweat coming off of your hands yeah. and going onto papers. Now, be the oils rather than the water, the like the yeah, oils. The oils, yeah. yeah. So that will destroy think, some types of paper, but not other types, maybe. That's correct. And is it to do with the print? Is it to do with the paper? Is it to do with the vellum that was used? I don't know. That's why I thought I'd ask you. Yeah. All right. I, it's on the. I mean, I, did, I wasn't aware of the of the of the contrast, the dichotomy. I wasn't aware that some ancient documents do not require special gloves. 
Um, but the question is there. Why, why, what, what, why do you wear gloves? What are the gloves for? Why do you wear them for some manuscripts and not for others? Why, why are children scared of the dark, but babies apparently aren't? That's got to be something to do with your imagination. What you need to do, what you need to do is find someone with no imagination, with no inner life whatsoever, and ask them if they're scared of the dark. Because I, I bet they're not. I bet that you, if you can find anyone that's got no imagination, you know someone like that. Everyone knows someone like that. Um, it, no inner life, no imagination, and find out whether or not they're scared of the dark, and that will prove my theory. 12.13 is the time. Terry's in Millwall. Terry, question or answer? Uh, question, please, James. Carry on, Terry. Um, if you're the young oldest sibling, old, oldest child, yeah. are your genes stronger than the youngest child, and therefore you tend to live longer? Mm. The parents being younger when they first had you, chances, you know, um, I'm talking this as a youngest child, so I've got skin in this game. Well, what, um, I, I don't, I mean, what, what do you mean by stronger, though? Do you just mean live, because well, there's a million... They will a, live longer, yeah, the oldest child that's tends not, to live longer. It's nothing to do with you, do they? Is the, does the oldest child tend to well, live longer? Well, to be honest, I'm looking at me and my mum and dad's side, and it's yeah. worked on that, it's, it's, the youngest so, have gone that side, and my, my father-in-law's... It's worked on that side, right. and I'm just thinking... So that's based entirely upon your own family tree, not on any sort yeah, of... Yeah, and also, okay. and also uh, years ago, an old fella told me this in a pub. Did He's he? just come back from his, his brother's funeral, and he told me that the oldest child is always going to have the stronger genes because the parents at the time of making him were... Fitter. Real, I went a lot younger, and yeah. Well, I don't well, I mean, it's unlikely, I'd have thought, but... It's, it's bad working. news. It's bad news for some people, isn't it? If it's bad true, news for me. It's bad news for you. I don't know if I like the phrase "stronger genes." I don't know if that's helpful in this context. So, if we said longevity, is there a relationship between being younger and older siblings and longevity? Yeah, I mean, it is the first one. Is the first born always going to? You know, always, but. Is there, is there any link between being born first and living longer? That's what we want to yeah. know. Has you're anyone done? Someone would have done. Someone's done the numbers, and if obviously if there is, we want to know why. But if I were you, Terry, I wouldn't worry too much. I'm not. I'm were, not. were you at the football last night? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I got yeah, a I'm message back there I, on Saturday as well. Oh Lord, I got a message off Danny Baker this morning. He said, "I think we're going to have to call it the St. Valentine's Day Massacre." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm off the drink as well, so that don't help. Oh dear, oh dear, it's, it's, it's queuing up. The punishments are queuing up. Take care. It's twelve fifteen. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. It is eighteen minutes after twelve, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we would like to know why uh, why children become scared of the dark. They're not scared of the dark when they're tiny, but they become scared of the dark. Why some manuscripts demand the wearing of special gloves while others don't, and whether there is any relationship between longevity and among siblings and the order in which you were born. I like those questions. Someone just tweeted that they weren't very good this week. Xander tweeted, come on, what rubbish quests get lost, Xander? They're really good questions, those. Honestly, everyone's a critic. Um, Trevor is in Frimley. Trevor, what would you like to say? Uh, question, James. Carry on. Question, for, well, from my, from my daughter Eloise. Oh. When we were eating a, a jar of pickles the other day, she said, Ooh, Daddy, nice. why is it that when we eat pickles, only one of my eyes goes all squiffy? Does that happen to other people? Absolutely. I had no idea. <laughs> I've been oh, really, yeah. I've been a bit worried about that for about two years. Because I, I have oh, a, no, a, don't laugh. The family. Don't laugh, Trevor. Um, Eloise is allowed to laugh, but you're not. The, I, I have kefir in the morning, like a fermented goat's milk, would you believe? It's one of my few um, uh, submissions, if you like, to, to encroaching age. And it, it's, it's worked wonders. I won't go into any details, Trev, but it's worked wonders <laughs> for my guts, it has. It's worked wonders for my guts. and But it is very sour. And my left eye twitch. I don't get it with pickles. I eat a lot of pickles, would you believe? But, but with that particular drink, my left eye goes a bit. My left eye twitches a bit. Interesting that it's your left eye, because we've looked at ours, and it's our left eyes as well that seem to twitch. And so it's a sourness triggering a twitch. Yes. So, I mean, is the question, why is it only one eye, or is the question actually, what's going on there then? Well, the question from Eloise was, why is it only one eye? But it would be good to know what's going on there as well. I'm just I'm sort of doing little twitches now in the studio, like involu <laughs> vol voluntary rather than involuntary twitches. 
Oh, you know, that's a superb question, actually. I, I hope we get an answer because I really, really want to know now. And, and I'm going to break the habit of a lifetime and I'm going to allow both of them, as a tribute to a, the brilliance of Eloise's inquiry, I'm going to let both of them stand, actually. I, I want to know why it's only one eye, but that quest, that answer will probably also involve an explanation of what is actually going on. Superb. Perfect. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you, Eloise. 21 minutes after 12 is the time. Zara is in Kingston. Zara, question or answer? Answer, James. Carry on. It's about why children of kind of school age are afraid of the dark. Yes, why they become afraid of the dark. So there's there's quite a few answers. So should I give you the headings and you can tell me which one I should expand on? Well, where are the headings coming from? I'm a child psychotherapist. Oh, and fantastic. it's a kind of developmental thing, yeah. Yeah, go on then. So, uh, one is evolution. Because is... we will be frightened of threat. And, and we if we... So when we can't see threat... So being frightened, of, being frightened be... is a good thing because it means you're less likely to be eaten by the thing that you're frightened of if you're frightened of it. can't see anything and you hear kind of something and you're in a yeah. cave, you should rightly be a bit scared of that. Yeah, got it. Next. Mm -hmm. Let's do them all, one at a time. Carl Jung, a, a contemporary of Freud, without sounding really like, well, um, he, was, he had a theory about the shadow self and that children became afraid of monsters under the bed, essentially, because they were becoming aware of the darker side of themselves. Oh, very Jungian. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I subscribe to that one so no. much as the... Although a lot of therapy is still Jungian, isn't it, in, 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 in essence, in its source. I, 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 that's a really thought-provoking theory, which I haven't heard before. But carry on, so that's one of them. The final one is something I work a lot with, and it's actually, it's not so much a fear of the dark, it's a fear of separation, because... Yeah. Parents know about separation anxiety during the day when you drop your toddler off at nursery and they cry. But actually at night, that's a really big separation. And you've gone from being together all day to suddenly being on your own. And, you know, you kind of have to pretend to be asleep in order to fall asleep. It's a weird skill to learn. Yes. And children actually just aren't quite ready. It's a really big transition away from their parents. And often it comes out as I'm afraid to be on my own in the dark. But actually what it is, is I'm afraid to be without you and I'm not ready to So they'd still, well, hang on, because under that theory, they'd still be afraid if the lights were on. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which isn't the case. No, but they tend to, because children don't have, often have the insight to know exactly what they are afraid of. They can kind of think okay. of what... Okay, yeah, so separation anxiety is, uh, is, is, is quite angsty. It's like an angst rather than a very specific, yeah, so mummy's not here, therefore I'm frightened. Yes, yeah, so often what I have to support it, with the parents I support through this, it's about kind of translating what your toddler is saying or doing or your child is saying or doing and thinking, I wonder if what you're really saying oh, is like that, that you're not ready to say goodbye. Yeah. Can I ask a favour, James? Oh, hang on. Not really. Go on. Get ready. Well, hang I... on a minute, Keith. Get ready with the dump button in case this gets <laughs> awkward. Go on. So I offer all of this advice for free and I really do just love supporting parents and I don't want everyone to have to pay extortionate fees for it. Is there anywhere I could mention my Instagram? Because I do yeah, of course you help can. parents no, with of course it. You oh, can. Thank, That's you. Fine. thank you, James. Um, so it's the therapy shed with a full stop in between. So the stop, therapy stop, shed. And anyone that messages me with any questions about ch children, I will always answer and I'm not going to charge a penny for it. I do, just do you know how many people listen to this programme? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, on your head be it. And I obviously can't bear any responsibility for any interactions that you may well have with people, but you sound lovely. But, you, I mean, I, 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 crikey, you could, you could regret that, Zara. Don't think so. If it gives me a massive platform to help people for free, oh, I'm all in. Fantastic. Thank you. I, well, in order, I would go with, I think in contradiction to what you believe, I'd put evolution first, separation anxiety second, and then Carl Jung's theory of the shadow self third but i think they all contribute to the overall idea that as your imagination develops so too does your capacity for fear of the unknown and the unknowable also this, a theory of mind thing so around the age of five you suddenly become aware of oh other people think differently to yeah, me yeah and that's also kind of part of it it's, it's a brain development thing round of applause for zara <laughs> lovely stuff thank you 25 after 12 is the time darren is in taplo darren question or answer it's a question, James. Carry on. Right. Why can I hear the, the sound of the water change from my tap as it gets warmer? Uh, so if you weren't if looking at it, on, you'd, know from, you'd, know from, you'd know from the sound that it had got hot? Yep, I do it every day. I like that. It, it, it happened. 
and now I'm curious. Wow. I, I mean, it's... Yeah. It's, it's, I, I just have a sense in my head that hot water is softer for some reason than cold water. Yeah. yeah. Do you know I've, what I mean? I've got, all, I've got the theories... But why? Well, you've got, well but we know that when it's hot, the atoms, are, the molecules are bouncing around a lot more. So the physical properties of hot water are different from the physical properties of cold water. Okay. I kind of could have worked it out, but I didn't want to believe it. Yeah, I think that's what... It, I'll get someone <laughs> cleverer than me to explain it in more fancy language. But, I, <laughs> but it must be that the physical... The, the, the physical... Because the molecules are oscillating wildly, the physical properties of hot water must be different from cold water which means that its interaction with another body in this case the hard surface yeah. of a basin is going to be different is going to and therefore it will sound different because the uh, transfer of what would it be potential heat and kinetic energy <laughs> into sound yeah. energy is is going to the the, the the ratios are going to be different you sound really clever i got a d mate in physics <laughs> that was really good. That was yeah, that, yeah, but I've always been good at debating. <laughs> so that was proof. I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I sounded like I did. I'll be in the cabinet by tea time. Philip is in Sandhurst. Actually, that's not true. They don't know what they they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't sound like they do anymore. But there was a time. Question or answer, Philip? Uh, it's a question, James. Nice yes. to speak to you. Yeah, likewise. Um, when you look up the night sky, and if it's a nice clear sky, you'll be lucky enough to see a shooting star. Yes. And um, they usually go from left to right, right to left, or over your head. But yeah. can you see them if they're coming directly, directly at you? Well, how would we ever know? Well, you might see one. Well, so we that's can. That's so this why answer. That's, this, why I'm answer, that's kind of why I'm answering asking the question. The question can only be answered in the affirmative. If the answer is no, we wouldn't know. Because uh, no one would have ever have seen. No, no, no one would ever have seen it, would they? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you're what right, you're saying is, can you see? Is now, it? But... Can you see a thing you can't see? So no one can answer that except. So if you can see it. Let me rephrase the question. No, there's nothing what wrong with the question. See? There's nothing wrong with the question. Well, you wouldn't see anything, would you? What would you see if a shooting star was coming directly at you? Well, either a shooting star or nothing. And if the answer's nothing, no one can tell us. Okay, so if you see it, what would it look like, though? Because you see they're a streak across the sky because they're not heading directly at you. But if they're di heading they directly They can't be heading at directly you, at you. Why... Because it, well, it would not. have to have consistent velocity to be heading directly at you. It was going to have to drop a little bit with each few metres, isn't it, if it's falling out of the sky? It's not going to come well, at you I in a straight it... line like a, you know, like a line on a graph. Well, I mean, a, a, a bullet travelling towards you at great speed doesn't have a constant velocity, but you, I, I doubt if it's coming towards you, you can see the back end of it. Well, you wouldn't need to see the back end of it. You can see the bullet. No, no, but I'm not talking about bullets, James. I'm talking you just about literally stars. talked about bullets. No, you, you, you went off on a segue. Right, okay. There's a, so. All right, hands up if you think I brought bullets into this conversation. <laughs> Nothing. How many or, hands are or up, you James? Think, or you think Philip did. Boom! Every hand in the building <laughs> has just gone through the roof. I didn't mention bullets at all. All right. Let's stick a pants. So, <laughs> so, so, how can can you can you see a shooting star if it's coming straight towards you? Or more aptly, what would you see? Yeah. Wait there, mate. Okay. Oh, no, stay there. Put it on the board, mate. Yeah, I, I will, mate. But just bear with me. Who let him on? Who put this? Who put? Fe oh, God, look at that. They're talk about. I tell you, you think the hands went up quickly when I asked who brought bullets into it. You should see how they're all trying to throw each other under a bus now, Phil. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to say it's Keith, but I'll be lying. <laughs> it's Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. Call 0345 6060 973. I can't take texts, even if um, you are supremely qualified. If you can't get through, I can't talk to you. That's how it works. I can't have... 
a VIP lane on Mystery Hour. So uh, I mean, some of these messages really are tempting. I am a paper conservator and I can answer the question on why you do and do not wear gloves. My name is Amanda and I currently work at Edinburgh University. This is my number. 07, I'm joking, I'm not going to read her number out live on the radio, but I can't do it, Amanda, because listen, I don't know, I have to phone Stephen in Milton Keynes who says, I'm trying to get through, but I can't. Neil deGrasse Tyson wants... But, 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 but I can't. I, yeah, it's so frustrating sometimes, especially if we get to the end of Mystery Hour without the questions being answered that you've answered on text. But I made these rules up many years ago for reasons I can't entirely remember, and I can't change them now. Well, I can, but I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, Andy's in Tynmouth in Devon. Andy, question or answer? Question, please, James. Carry on. Um, I've been reading a history textbook. Oh, yeah. Um, and just on Passel, it mentions that during the French Revolution... After they guillotined um, Louis XIV, mm. they changed the order of playing cards. So that prior to killing the king... It, it says, it says to... this in the book, in the history yeah, book. And, and a very, very authoritative history book written by an incredibly well-known author. Who? Which, is, which has got things at the, you know, pages of references at the back. Yeah, so is mine, and mate. Then... I wouldn't read too much into that. How, how, who's it by? Tell... very good as well, I have to say. You're very kind. Who's it by? Uh, it's by a guy called Sam Wills. Okay. And it says and that, well, it must probably be true then. Why are you doubting it? Just because you've never heard it before. It just seems so unlikely. It does, the doesn't it? suddenly say, okay, now one is bigger than a king because we've killed our king. Surely the rest of the world would say, well, we're not having any of that and we, we don't get on with your French 80 thing. Yeah. We're not having any of it. Or they get rid of it altogether. He chopped his head off. Why have you left him in your pack of cards? Yeah, it could be that as well. Could just go Jack, Queen, Ace. So, well, you probably have to get rid of the queen as well. To be fair, yeah, that's a good point, my yeah. mate. Yeah, well, thank you, um, <laughs> Marie Antoinette, wasn't it? The, uh, yeah, it was. The, so, what well, is it true that the, the the order of rank on a pack of cards changed after the execution of Louis the Fourteenth? Exactly. Well, I'm like, I'm with you on this. I, uh, it seems very, very unlikely to me. But well, as, as your producer said, she just went, "Really?" And that, you know, I was, I was reading serious facts, and then I just, well, I read that and I went. Really? No. no. Really? No. <laughs> then you went, no. You go, really? No. <laughs> I'm going to phone James O'Brien. <laughs> no. There it is. Well, let's find out. It's not me that would know the answer to that. Well, I sometimes do, but not on this occasion. Is that true? And can we go definitive on it, do you think? 0345 6060 973. Thank you, Andy. Ashley's in Bournemouth. Ashley, question. Oh, it's all by the seaside today. Question or answer, Ashley? Hi, James. That's a question. Carry on. So I used to wear hair extensions oh, yes. and they were made of real human hair, which Ooh. I imagine someone shaves their head and, you know, sells their hair or whatever. You said, yes, and, that's what I yeah, did. Um, that's what I did. That's why, that's why I look a bit bald. I was thinking of others, oh, Ashley. I was always thinking well, of others. Well, then you'll be really interested in this question then. Yes. So I was wondering, how do they make synthetic hair extensions? Because I bought a fake ponytail for a night out the other yeah, week and you? they're much cheaper than real human hair. Yeah. But then I was looking at them and, you know, how are they made in the factory? Are they extruded from a material or and how does it work in the factory where they don't get all tangled up? So how do we make synthetic hair? What are they made of? What did it say on um, the ingredients? Some sort of plastic, I guess. But, um, but they don't look as obviously as natural as real human hair because it's quite shiny and plasticky. And, you how know, close do you have spend, to get to think it doesn't look real? Well, I mean, you can buy them from like Tesco, uh, you know, a cheap fake. But could you, could you, you, yeah? So, did your friends know that you were wearing a fake? Well, I suppose they'd be a bit confused about why you managed to grow a ponytail since the last time they saw you. (laughs) But I used to wear the human ones, but they're very expensive. Yeah. But how do they make? How do they make the synthetic hair? Because it seems like yeah. It's Louis the Sixteenth that got decapitated, of course, not Louis the Fourteenth. Thank you for the reminder. But now we also need to know, (laughs) just as an illustration of how all human life is here. And indeed, synthetic life. How do they make fake hair? How and did Louis have a fa- fake hair? He had or? lovely hair. All the Louis yeah. had lovely hair. It, was, uh, <laughs> it didn't wash it much in those days, but it was, there was plenty of it. Um, although they wore wigs, didn't they? Of course. Yeah. They were, they, were they real or were they fake? I don't, well, there's a good question. You're not allowed yeah. it now because you've already asked the oh, other sorry, one about your own. Sorry. Your own fa- <laughs> so when you wore your fake ponytail, yes. did you like the effect or, or would you not be doing it again? I thought it was all right because it was only like a tenner off the internet, whereas the real human hair extensions. Um, uh, you what know, did you do? You sort of clip it under your hair. Yeah. Clip, clip, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah. I might have a little, little look at that. I could, I could yeah, be one of those. You'd forget one, couldn't you? I could be one of those elderly Italian men that you see at the beach who've got a bald <laughs> head but quite a long ponytail. I could, I could rock that look. I think. Thank you, <laughs> Ashley. It's on the list. How, 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 what, are, what are fake hair extensions made of? Twelve thirty-nine is the time. And Ali, oh, it's two phone lines free. Stop texting me to tell me that you can't get through. There is literally two phone lines free now. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine ten three. Ali's in Barnet. Ali, question or answer? It's an answer, James. Carry on. Uh, so it's for the question uh, that the gentleman posed about whether it's true that firstborns are more likely to oh, yeah. live longer. Um, so I'll start off by saying the evidence is a bit inconclusive, but there is some interesting studies that have been done on this. Um, and the studies have just basically sought out to see how likely they are to live to the age of 100. Okay. So, and what they've sort of found is that it is actually true, but it's actually dependent on the mother's age at which she had the uh, oh, child. okay. So before the, pro- obviously, you know, it's quite common knowledge that uh, the quality of the female eggs declines rapidly uh, sort of before the age of 30. Right. And so having a child before that time obviously then gives them the highest chances of living longer and not having been predisposed to any genetic conditions like type 1 diabetes or anything like that. So it basically aids fetal development. Um, whereas having it later on, uh, and there's also other theories so about some chromosomes and then. telomere lengths and yeah, things like that. That makes so, sense. It makes it makes sense, doesn't it? But there's also other research that suggests that um, younger born siblings are more likely to take sort of take part in risk taking behaviours and things like that. So there's other factors involved oh, other than just pure yeah, genetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is a bit of a complicated process, but this is a fascinating area of uh, of. Sort of uh, research like epigenetics and things, but um, it is inconclusive. The stuff that they've done is on like animal studies, and and the sample sizes aren't that big. But it is interesting to say the least. That's a pretty good answer. Question or answer? Uh, sorry, qualifications. Oh, qualifications! I've got a first class degree in pharmacology, and I'm a biology teacher. Okay, that'll do. Well done. <laughs> nice one, Ali. I bet you're a great teacher because I understood everything you said, which is a miracle. <laughs> thank you, I got thank a B. You. I got a B in, but I don't know why I'm telling everyone what grades I got in 1988. But I did, or 1980, yeah, 1980. I got a B in biology, which is by far my best science subject, and I understood all of that. But I bet you'd have to be an even better physics teacher than you are a biology teacher to explain physics to me. B in biology, C in chemistry, D in physics. And if you think about the amount of money my parents spent on my education, frankly, they should have got a refund. Thank you, Ali. Adrian's in Alverchurch. Everything's beginning with A this hour. Alison, Ali, Adrian, Alverchurch. Uh, question or answer, Adrian? Uh, answer, please, James, to Ca- the shooting star. Oh, good man. Carry on. Right. The answer is, is that if it wasn't going across your path, it would still burn up. And so you would see it as a point of light that would quickly get brighter and then fade. Got it. Qualifications? Uh, amateur astronomer, and I also have two meteor cameras. We're part of the uh, UK Meteor Network. Have you really? Gosh. Yeah. Um, so you'd see it coming towards you as a ball of light getting brighter, and then it would start fading. Yeah, that's right. And the UK Meteor Network, it's um, there's a network of cameras across the country. Uh, what they do is because you're looking at the meteors that are coming in at different angles, yeah. you can work out the trajectory of them. So if they're large enough can. to land, and sometimes they are, then the, the cameras now are so accurate that you can actually work out sometimes within a sort of few hundred metres or something like that. And um, you remember the, the witch bowl meteorite? I do, The yeah. one that landed? Yeah, that was an example of that because they had the cameras. They were able to work out the trajectory uh, and it meant that they could actually find the meteorite when it landed before it had actually been degraded by oh, rain and weather conditions and oh, oh, so fantastic. on and so forth. Um, when did you get into it? Uh, well, I've been into astronomy for years. I've been mm. part of the Meteor Network for about 18 months, two years, something like that. I love that. Um...
Can, can, can we give Adrian a lovely round of applause? Don't go away, Adrian. I've got a question for okay. you, actually. OK. Thank you very much. Stay there. I don't do this very often. You know I'm from Kidderminster. Uh, yeah, just up the road. That's right. So I know something about Alva Church uh, that will make quite an interesting question for a hook and tease. I like to do hook and teases these days. I don't really need to okay. do them during Mystery Act because people are going to stay listening over the break. But some people sometimes get distracted. Why is Alva Church? What? What? You, and if you know the answer, it won't be a hook and tease because you have to tell me. But what? <laughs> what is the significance of Alva Church? Alv Church in the history of British radio. Oh, the good, history it's a, of radio. It's a good one, this Adrian. British radio. The, his, the history of British radio. I, I, I don't know. Oh, um, no, no. One, I don't know. I do. I know a little bit. I know a little bit about radio, but but not about the history. No, of but it. I bet you're a techno bloke, aren't you? Know a bit about Marconi uh, and all that sort yeah, of thing. No, that's you're, got, you're barking up yeah. the wrong tree, Adrian. You're barking up no, the wrong right. tree. Go on then, spill the beans. I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll tell you after the next break. That's how it works. I'm building up tension now, Adrian. You've been like my stra- You've been Ernie Wise to my Eric Morecambe here. Oh, I've got to wait now. Then you've got to wait now. I'll just slap you on the chops like that a bit. <laughs> I'll see you okay. on the other side of the yeah. break, sunshine. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. This is LBC. It is 12.48 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, James is in Coventry. He says, please tell me that it was a brilliant masterstroke from Keith to go from a question about hair to somebody calling from Barnet. I wish, James. Yeah, well played. But no, it was a complete coincidence, which I should have spotted and made a joke about, but you beat me to it. Back to the questions in need of answers, and indeed, and uh, 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 still room for a couple more questions as well, although we do need quite a lot of answers now. The time, does that ever happen to you? I just glanced up. I thought it was about 20 past 12. It's 10 to 1, honestly. Anne's in Bangor, in Northern Ireland. Question or answer, Anne? It's a question, James. Um, I want to know Didn't when in American history... we have a lovely history... time? The time we went to Bangor. <laughs> Do you know that song? No, I don't. I've only been here for a few years. So uh, how many years have you been there for? Um, three years, just over three years. See, I, if, I, I can't believe you can live there and not know that song. For, during my childhood, that, so, that song was, uh, didn't we have a lovely time, the time we went to Bangor. So, <laughs> da, 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 we had fun under, da, and all for under a pound, you know. Can we get a clip of that before we go? Because Anne thinks I'm mad. Sorry, Anne, carry on. <laughs> no problem. Um, I want to know when in American history did the American accent that we know today become recognisably an American accent? Well, there's no such thing as the American accent that we know today. Is there any more than there's an Irish accent that we that we know today? But, there's, I mean, you, you're in you, Bangor. You you head to Dublin. You're going to hear completely different accents, yeah. but they're both Irish. But you'd recognise them as Irish, even though you don't necessarily recognise the regional origin. Can you do so any it, accents? Can I do any accents? Yeah. Um, not that we're willing to do on air. That I'm what? Say. No one's listening. <laughs> Have you, can you do an Irish accent? I'm trying, but it's really, really difficult. So that, I've been so, practicing the how now brown car. Uh, hi now, impossible. Hi now, brown car. There is a theory. <laughs> there is a theory that if you do an Irish accent and hold your nose, then yeah. then you get a kind of American accent coming out. It's something to do with the relationship <laughs> between immigration and the flu. So you kind of can imagine. So, yeah. so you might have you might have a nice Irish accent, and then you sort of hold your nose and you turn into an American. Did you hear? That's incredible. Did you hear that? That was, was actually. That was uncanny. Of... I can't believe my ears. So when de- so and also I have read that if you yeah. were to go back to the sort of 17th century, the way people spoke in this country would yeah. sound closer to what an American accent sounds like today than than a British accent does today. That's interesting. I didn't know that. No, yeah. we have got a caller in County Durham who may know the answer to this question. He rarely lets yeah. me down, but there's a first time for everything. It's on the list. When did the American accent become the recognisably American accent? Thank you, Anne. And I didn't invent that song. I can't believe no one's. Oh, it was. Oh, no, yeah. The day we went to bank. The day. Yeah. No, did it. I'm not going mad. Can we get a click? Can we have a quick? Anne, don't go away. Here it is. Are you ready? <laughs> See? You thought I made that up, didn't you? <laughs> Are you sure it's not Bangor in Wales? Oh, it is Bangor in Wales. You're absolutely right. God, <laughs> why did you ruin it all, Anne? I can't believe you did that. There's also that. another Bangor in the, in the Republic of Ireland. Well, it hasn't been specified which one it was, but now you come to mention it, it was obviously the one in Wales. Oh, that was a shame. I was enjoying that enormously. Can we get an answer for Anne after my music-based di- 
abstractions fell failed so miserably. Amanda is in Edinburgh. You're not a conservator by any chance, are you, Amanda? Who couldn't get through to the program earlier? I am that. Well, I I am a conservator, um, and I did try and ring in, but I, I texted first. But I, I, I'm I know. Here now. And then you got through because I did. You not hear I me am. read out your text? No, I didn't. Oh, that, so this joke completely fell almost as flat as my musical gag a moment ago. So I read out your text explaining why I can't let people contribute via text and I certainly can't ring in when people are kind enough to send me their phone numbers. But happily, you tried oh, again and you got I through. Didn't. I'm here. And here yeah. you are. Question or answer? It's an answer to the one regarding uh, why do we or do we not wear gloves Fantastic. with money grip. Fantastic. Yes. Um, so I'm a paper conservator and I work with many manuscripts and paper objects and Excellent. you do need to wear gloves sometimes, but right. normally with manuscripts, um, clean washed hands are fine. That's all you need. And, and in what, what, when do you have to wear gloves and in what circumstances? So if it's got any like metal, any like gold, silver, those type of thing, then you would wear gloves. But we wouldn't recommend you wear white gloves or cotton gloves or because they're just in theory like wearing mittens or like winter gloves. Yes. There's really little to no dexterity with them at all. So we would recommend like surgical gro- gloves. Nitrile. Nit- nit- nitrile yeah, gloves. exactly. And it's exactly. Because, because of the effect that the oils in your skin could have on the materials like the gold, but they're going to be fine with the actual paper. Exactly, yeah. Oh, that's superb. I know you've already told me, but the rules insist that I ask again. What are your qualifications? Um, so I'm a paper concept. I specialise in um, paper so and flat What are you working on at the moment? Yeah. What are you working on at the moment? Um, I've actually just got a Max Ernst up um, that I need to do some tear repairs on. So I'm going to do that this afternoon after <laughs> I've eaten. <laughs> how did, how did, don't forget to wash your hands. How did you, yeah. how did you get into it? Where did the enthusiasm blossom from? Um, so I did a, a fine art degree um, oh. in Newcastle, and then I my tech my technician was like Amanda because I make paper as well, and they were like, why don't you come and see this in Northumbria University um, offer the paper conservation course, oh. and that's how I got into it. That's yeah. absolutely that's one of my favourite answers of all time. Have a round of applause for me, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I have indeed, Chris, forgotten the answer to my question and no one's reminded me. I, I instruct my colleagues every day not to let me go home without revealing the answer to the question that I've posed on the show before a break. Uh, no one reminded me. So thank you, Chris, for stepping up to the plate. The, the answer to the question of why Alva Church in Worcestershire has a special place in British radio history is because the creator of the Archers was, was from there. Godfrey something. Godfrey Baisley was from there. And that, that that's a really good little bit of trivia for you. So whenever you hear the word Alva Church in future, which I grant you won't be often, you'll think of the Archers. And you'll also think of um, Adrian and his, his comet telescopes. They're fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Ed's in Mere in South Wiltshire. Question or answer, Ed? It's an answer, James. Thank you. It's the... Uh the uh, sound of, of water. Oh, good man. Carry on. Yes. Why do we think? Why does hot water sound different to tap to cold water, even as it comes out of the same tap at, or in the same sort of minute? All fluids, liquids, and gases are affected by change in temperature. Yes. And then, in fact, change of temperature changes the density, which alters the speed of sound. The density. So, co- cold yeah. water will, will sound will sound louder than warm water. Is it got something because to do with the molecules oscillating? It's just, it's just purely the density, yes. yes. Density changes. As, as so, a consequence uh, of the molecules moving at different speeds. Uh, that would be more that would be more viscosity, but, yeah. I mean, if you get bubbles in a oh, liquid, yeah. of course, that, that, will, that will affect the density what as a well. brilliant answer. What are your qualifications? Uh, I've been a mechanics of fluids engineer before I retired for 60 years. A mechanics of fluids engineer? What sort of things yes. do you... I'm, I'm, I've got such incredible callers today. What does that involve? What would, your, what would be a normal day's work as a mechanics of fluids engineer? Aerodynamics, ultrasound. Wow. All of the industrial sound applications for non-invasive measurements. And fi- finally, after 60 years, you've managed to put it all to some use today, Ed. <laughs> I'm age seventy. I'm age eighty-seven. It's it's, it's been it's been my, my 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 hope that I would sometimes speak to you, and of course, as I say to people, he's the the voice of reason. Oh, you're very very kind. Have at least a round of applause on me. Thank you, Ed. Oh wow, that's a beautiful qualification to answer that question as well. And how politely he sort of 
pointed out that I was talking out of my hat. <laughs> See, you can do these things nicely. I told you he'd come. He's like Banquo's ghost. Mark's in Barrow in Furnace. To answer, I venture, the American accents question. What is it, Mark? Yes, hi, hi James. You're basically, you're right to suggest 17th or 18th century. Oh, thank you. And, and as you'll appreciate, in those conditions, with no telecommunications and no rapid transport, varieties that diversified tended to stay diversified. Yes. Once you were in North America, you would hardly ever talk to anyone in the British Isles. And, and both t- sets of varieties diversified. So, for example, in the course of the 18th century, most varieties of British English lost the R in words like car. Whereas an American would say car. Cara. Cara. And yeah. a few American varieties lost it. Boston is well known with the famous Kennedy vowel in yes, Park, of car in the Harvard Yard. Yeah. And in the southern varieties down in Louisiana and so on. But most of North America, including British Canada, retained that R. Mm. So they did not change. But they did change in some other respects. The vowel system changed. And the, vowel, the distinction between long and short vowels disappeared, and some of the rounded vowels became unrounded. So Americans say job instead of job, and so on. Job, job. So, so there's a whole series of little changes so it's, that gradually it, it, accumulate. It, it, it's a beautiful answer, and, and I'm short of time. Sheila's here. So, so to answer the question that was asked, the, there isn't, I mean, I've written down Banger instead of the poor woman's name. Was it Anne? It was, it was Anne in back, wasn't it? <laughs> she, she, she can't call her Banger. Can you she not? She was a right Banger. Can you stop? <laughs> so, uh, it was Anne in Banger. Yeah. That's Banger yeah. in Northern Ireland, not Banger in Wales, oh, where okay. the song's about. So, so the, the accent that we think of American is actually English. Old yeah, English. T- yeah, with Up to some a point. changes of with, their Yeah, own. With the, which you've just brilliantly highlighted. Ones. And not Lots all of, of little it. Little changes over the years, and then and some of it will of be Latino. Winter. You'll have other influences yeah. from the from Eastern Europe and from Holland and all of that. But but generally speaking, to think of it as an American accent is probably a bit wrong. Except it's an how, oversimplification. Yes, but, but still, it's mystery how we oversimplify <laughs> most things, except when you're on qualifications, Mark. Long-standing linguist. Long-standing linguist. Round of applause for Mark, please. Uh, very hard this week. Some, so, some people have already had a game, but I think I'm going to give it to Anne in Bangor because uh, why not? I, I can't believe I got that song wrong, but at least we played it. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player. If you do, it's Bangor in Wales, not Bangor in Northern Ireland. It's the official LBC app where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now... It's time for Sheila Fogarty. 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 It's time for Sheila.